Uh, if there's panelists that's names that you don't see there, if you, if you wanna send them a message to, to come on. Um, but for the record, my name is Ricardo Arroyo. I'm the chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Public Health. Uh, I'm joined by my colleagues, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Campbell, uh, Councillor Bach, Councillor Braden, Councillor Sabi George, uh, Councillor O'Malley, uh, Councillor Flaherty, uh, Council President Kim Janey. Uh, I believe that's everybody uh, as I work through this list. Um, I wanna remind everybody that this is a public hearing. It is being recorded and will be rebroadcasted on Comcast 8, RCN 82 and Verizon 1964 at a later date. It is currently being streamed at boston.gov uh, slash city council TV. Uh, we will also take public testimony at the end of the hearing. If you are somebody watching this and are interested in, in testifying, please email Ron Cobb at boston.gov, R-O-N dot C-O-B-B at boston.gov for the link uh, and follow along on the live stream to know when it's your turn to speak. Uh, for those speaking for public comment, please state your name and affiliation residence and limit your comments to two minutes uh, to ensure that all comments and concerns can be heard. Uh, today's hearing is on docket 0638, which is the order for a hearing on the proposed guidelines for ventilator distribution and ICU beds in the event of a shortage and ensuring that health inequities do not dictate uh, medical care during the COVID-19 panic, uh, uh, sorry, pandemic. Uh, our speakers today uh, are Dr. Joseph Weinstein uh, from Stewart Healthcare, uh, Michael Curry, uh, or a representative from the Mass League of Community Health Centers, uh, Dr. Lena Habash from the Boston Medical Center, uh, Dr. Hazar Kadir from Massachusetts General Hospital, Dr. Wendy Macias Constantopoulos uh, from the Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, Dr. Alistair Martin from the Massachusetts General Hospital, but also uh, the Harvard Medical School of Social Equity, uh, Dr. Uh, Onini Chi I K from Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, Radhika Jane, Radhika Jane from Massachusetts General Hospital, Cody Sitchwitz. Uh, Ch Chichowitz, sorry, from Mass General, uh, Desta uh, Dest Lee Sanu from Mass General, uh, Brigham's and Women's uh, has a representative on Yika Otogo, and Dr. Andrew Marshall from Beth Israel Deaconess uh, are all here with us today. Um, and so the format for this, uh, there's, there's a number of speakers there. Uh, because there's so many first line responders, we were unsure how many folks would be able to actually make it. Uh, I'm grateful to all of you for actually being here uh, to speak on something as important as uh, racial equity in uh, crisis of care guidelines um, to very clearly kind of just give a run of show. Uh, I'm going to give an opening. I'm going to kick it over to the original co-sponsor, uh, Andrea Campbell, to also give an opening. At that point, uh, we're going to go to the panelists. Uh, I know that Dr. Joseph Weinstein from Stewart Healthcare has a hard stop, and so we're going to let him go first and then open it up to questions after he speaks, uh, and then uh, I'll open it up to uh, the rest of our panel. Uh, for the folks uh, on the panel speaking, I'm going to try and keep everybody to about two to five minutes, if you could please respect that time. Uh, for the counselors that are here, I'm going to go in order of appearance. Uh, I'm going to try and keep you to five minutes. Uh, if you'd like to give an opening in that five minutes, uh, if you don't have a question or you want to incorporate that into your statement, that's fine. Um, at the end of the hearing, I'll also give space for closings uh, if, if counselors want to give final thoughts. Um, and so we'll just do rounds of questions. Uh, so with that out of the way, uh, I just want to kind of give folks the uh, idea and the purpose and the reasoning behind what we're doing here. Uh, the Mass, uh, Massachusetts Department of Health released the standards for crisis of care uh, the standards of crisis of care that they released initially uh, gave myself, many of the folks that are here on the panel, many uh, experts and people of color, uh, pause because it considered racial uh, racial inequities in our healthcare system while still calling it a racially blind system. It was creating point systems based on pre-existing conditions and other factors that are heavily impacted by race and social equity and social impact. Uh, but claiming that in doing so, uh, it was creating sort of a race blind system for crisis uh, of care and, and rationing. Uh, the update to that has uh, dealt with some of that, but not all of it. Uh, it's, it's created something that has given me pause uh, that I'd like to let our, our doctors kind of speak on. And the goal here is to try to create uh, from folks in the field, the best guidelines we can create for uh, a race, uh, something that takes race into account in a positive way that makes sure that there's no disproportionate impact that the social inequities that we see on a daily basis 
uh, are addressed. And so with that, I'm going to uh, kick this over to uh, Councillor Campbell. Uh, and actually, just one other thing. I do want to thank uh, everybody who's here. I also want to note those that aren't here. Uh, we did receive two letters, one from uh, Rita Nieves from the Boston Public Health Commission, another from, uh, you just get the name, uh, Patricia McMullen from the Conference of Boston Teaching Hospitals. Uh, I want to be clear, I, I believe that should have been sent out to all the counselors, but for those on the phone or on video, uh, essentially the things that are missing in this five page letter that was sent on behalf of the participating hospitals of which uh, are numerous and I can give that list at a later time, but it's, it's essentially all of the major hospitals in the city missing in that five page letter is whether or not they are following these state guidelines, whether or not they've amended these state guidelines, whether or not they agree that there needs to be any continued amending of the state guidelines and whether or not they've created their own guidelines at their hospitals. And so for the doctors uh, and folks on the, on the phones here and, and on Zoom, uh, those are things that I would be very interested in getting answers to and also your, your take on how we can move forward. So with that, I'm gonna kick it over to Andrea Campbell. Um, thank you, Councilor Arroyo, and uh, thank you for the partnership here. Um, we obviously share Mattapan, and we have the neighborhoods that are hardest hit by COVID-19, including, uh, of course, uh, Mattapan High Park, Dorchester. Um, and then I also want to of course, bring up East Boston, given the numbers we're seeing out of East Boston, even though those, that neighborhood is not technically in our district. Um, I also want to thank the healthcare providers, the doctors, and all those who took time out of what I'm sure is an extremely busy schedule to join us at this uh, this hearing, this conversation. Um, it's really important that people in the community have an opportunity to learn more about what these guidelines are, to learn more about the crisis standards. I will tell you up until COVID-19, much of the language I didn't know myself. And so you can imagine the lay person not having understanding. So this hearing really is about creating a public space to have a conversation on something that is extremely important, that is a matter of life and death. And we hope that at some point we will not have to use these guidelines uh, or crisis uh, care standards. But if we do, people have a right to know what they are, to be able to weigh in. And I think uh, Councilor Arroyo and I recognize the lack of public process here. So this is the platform we wanted to use to make sure that there was a public process, but appreciate you guys taking your time to join us. Thank you for your expertise. Thank you for the work you do every day. And lastly, I will say, um, and uh, I've said this before, that we often are hearing from folks um, that they don't want to take race into consideration, that this is not about race, this is not about black and brown. And I've said plainly, that's a total mistake. Um, and that communities of color who have been marginalized, oppressed, um, excluded uh, for some time because of their race, um, now when thinking about the solutions to those problems, we absolutely have to talk about race. We need to employ a racial equity lens. Um, there are experts who do that really well. And so it's important and incumbent upon government to do the same. And of course, our hospitals as well, um, given the fact that many of these infections in the community as a result are as a result of underlying conditions um, that came about in, uh, and that outpace the regular population of, of our community in communities of color because of race and racism. Um, so I'm really excited to have this conversation with you guys to learn more. I think Council Arroyo did sum it up well, the, the piece that while there have been changes to the guidelines at the state level, um, folks want to understand, of course, what they are, but they also want to understand how are our individual hospitals and the hospital systems applying those guidelines, using those guidelines, what are the conversations amongst the board members of these various hospitals about these guidelines, um, and what ultimately will be implemented if we were to come to a place where we have to use these um, because of the limitation on ventilators and ICU beds. Um, I don't want to talk the entire time. I'm going to do a lot of listening. Thank you, Council Royal, for the partnership, and thank you to my colleagues as well. And uh, with that, I just want to acknowledge uh, Councillor Mejia and Councillor Wu have both joined us. Uh, and so uh, with that, I'm going to uh, go directly to uh, Dr. Joseph Weinstein. Uh, if you can give sort of a background, a brief background, and also uh, if you can just uh, give your presentation and then uh, I'll open up to questions to the counselors at that point in the order of appearance. Thank you. You're, you're unmuted now. Actually, not yet. Just waiting for it to unmute. There you go, now you're unmuted. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Royho and members of the council. I just want to make sure you can hear me. Yep, we can hear you. Thank you. My name is Dr. Joseph Weinstein, and I am the Chief Medical Officer for Steward Healthcare System, 
of which both Kearney Hospital in Dorchester and St. Elizabeth's Medical Center in Brighton are a part. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to provide the council with an update of Stewart Healthcare's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Stewart Healthcare has taken a systematic, proactive and comprehensive approach to balance the need of accommodating the rise in COVID-19 patients while maintaining the level and quality of care for all of our patients and the communities we serve, including Boston, Brighton, Dorchester, and other communities. Our preparation began months ago when the virus initially emerged in the United States. We launched a substantial program to acquire and stockpile specialty equipment required to treat these patients, including ventilators and personal protective equipment. Many of these resources have been strategically distributed to our hospitals, including Kearney and Dorchester and St. Elizabeth's in Brighton. Since the beginning of March, we have tested more than 16,000 patients uh, across Massachusetts for COVID-19, and we've handled over 1,400 inpatient admissions across Massachusetts. From a statewide capacity perspective, we completed expansion of our medical surgical beds by 207 to a total of 899 beds across our system. And we increased our expansion of ICU beds by 77 beds to a total of 202 beds. We were also able to supplement our staff with 63 experienced nurses and respiratory therapists from out of state steward facilities and added 239 temporary nurses from outside the steward system with more than 120 steward Massachusetts nurses who volunteered to be reassigned to the communities with the greatest need. These moves have enabled us to better serve communities across Eastern Massachusetts, including Dorchester, Brighton, Boston, and other communities that we serve. With all of this, both of our Boston hospitals are well positioned to manage the surge of COVID-19 patients. As of April 20th, at Kearney Hospital, we have 77 COVID positive patients. Our hospital capacity was at 64%. We have expanded our ICU bed capacity by six to a total of 16 beds and expanded our medical surgical bed capacity by 33 for a total of 59 beds. We currently have 32 total ventilators, including invasive and non-invasive ventilators, and currently have no shortage of ventilators at Kearney Hospital. At St. Elizabeth's Medical Center, as of April 20th, we have over 50 COVID positive inpatients. Our hospital capacity was at 57%. We have a total of 140 medical surgical beds and expanded our ICU bed capacity by 15 to now have a total of 43 beds um, in total. We currently have 51 total ventilators there, including invasive and non-invasive ventilators. And again, have more than adequate capacity to handle the inpatients and the patients we expect in our emergency room. We continue to monitor trends in caseloads and are working closely with both the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and the Boston Public Health Commission. Thank you for the chance to speak today and for your continued leadership on this issue. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Uh, it, it means a lot that you're here uh, under the conditions to address our communities and make these things clear. And so uh, at this point, uh, though everybody else will give testimony later as a group and then answer questions sort of as a group for this particular uh, uh, testimony, we're gonna open it up to the council. Uh, I'll, I'll begin with my questions, which uh, frankly, um, thank you for being here. Uh, and in terms of uh, steward uh, healthcare, have there been, uh, have to your knowledge, uh, has there ever has there been any denial at this point of uh, any kind of crisis of care, uh, any ICU, any uh, ventilator? Or how are you doing in that department in terms of uh, availability? So we have not had to deny any patient any form of life sustaining care, including ventilators, medication, or other any uh, other life sustaining treatment. Um, we have been more than able to handle the capacity, which has presented to our institutions. And again, we've been um, fairly strategic in acquiring stockpiles of resources to make sure um, when the surge did hit, we were more than able to handle that. So the answer to your question is no. No one has been denied care at Kearney or St. Elizabeth's or any of our steward facilities. That's, uh, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, and uh, I guess the second question on this is, in the event that the surge 
leads to a situation where we may have to do that. Uh, at Kearney or Steward, what crisis of care guidelines are you currently using uh, to make those decisions? Are you using the state guidelines? Are you using some of the state guidelines, but not all the state guidelines? Or do you have some internal guidelines that you've created for, for that uh, scenario? So we had an internal set of guidelines that we had created. Um, as you're, you're aware, the state just released additional sets of guidelines just 48 hours ago, which we're currently in the process of reviewing and making a determination about um, adopting those guidelines. Uh, currently, though, um, we take care of patients in very socioeconomically disadvantaged communities. I mean, we're in Dorchester and we're in Brockton and we're in Methuen and Fall River and Taunton. So we really don't find any evidence that um, you know, we, we have to make a decision about one individual versus another. First, we have more than adequate capacity. And secondly, we take care of patients in socioeconomically disadvantaged communities all the time. It, it is certainly our belief and certainly our stance that every patient is deserving of the very best possible care that we can deliver. Thank you, I appreciate that. And this is my final question before I kick it to uh, my other counselors here. Uh, in, in terms of the new guidelines, they, they have a guideline there that is particularly troubling to me when it comes to socioeconomic impact and racial impact, which is uh, the ability for doctors to essentially assess or determine uh, whether or not somebody will be survived, their survival uh, chances in the next five years uh, or their patient survival for up to five years. Uh, in terms of the decision-making that would go into making a call like that in those conditions, for doctors, uh, what kinds of things would, if you were to even do that, what what kinds of things would you be taking into account there? As a lay person, to me, that language sounds like, or suggests that you would be taking into account uh, underlying conditions like diabetes or heart disease or uh, you know uh, hypertension or things like that that could still give that inequitable racial response uh, in terms of its output. Uh, but it, perhaps, I mean, I, I'm happy to hear because I'm not a doctor, uh, what the, what kind of analysis would go into figuring out somebody's survival for up to five years and, and how a doctor would be able to do that in the kind of urgent situation of denying, uh, you know, crisis care like ICU or ventilators. Sure. So first, um, let me just say that I think by virtue of the fact that we've had adequate resources and that we've um, been able to plan well in advance for the surge, we, thank goodness, have not had to make those decisions. Secondly, we have chosen to use more short-term survival guidelines like SOFA scores and other um, assessments uh, of survival within a hospitalization. Um, third, and again, I think I commented on this earlier, we live in communities and work in communities and provide care in communities which basically are very heavily affected by heart failure, diabetes, and other socioeconomic um, conditions, including drug abuse, alcohol abuse, and others. So I, I would just um, say that we have not used a five-year survival tool. Um, we'll continue to study the crisis standards of care that were released and recently released by the Department of Public Health. Um, again, our tools predominantly have been short-term survival as opposed to looking at anything that's a long-term survival tool. Um, the SOFA tool that we have um, seen incorporated both in the initial set of guidelines as well as in steward internal guidelines, just looks at someone's ability to survive the acute care hospitalization. We have not chosen to look at um, anything in terms of longer care hospitalization, frankly, because all of our patients tend to have some of those socioeconomic comorbidities. Thank you so much. And so uh, just a brief follow-up on that, what you just said. Is it safe to say that she would suggest or that you believe at Steward Healthcare that the short-term morbidities are more important than or a better metric for this than the five-year survival? I think we're still studying the, the document that came out. Again, it's some 40 some odd pages, it was just released 36 hours ago. And I, I would be reluctant to basically say that we've committed to a, 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 an absolute solution. Thankfully, we do not have to make those decisions today. But I think we are looking, we're looking more at short-term survival than we have been at long-term survival when we have been trying to figure out how we would make that decision if it when if and when it came about. Thank you so much, and hopefully we don't have to make those decisions. Uh, this is more about preparedness, and I and I do want to reiterate to folks that are watching that those decisions haven't had to be made yet. Uh, if I can go to uh, Councillor Andrea Campbell. 
Thank you, um, and thank you, Dr. Weinstein, for being here. I really appreciate it and know how busy you are. Um, and also thank you for the work you're doing at Stewart and, and McCarney, and in particular, a lot of my folks go there um, and understand the population you serve, uh, similar to many of the community health centers. A couple of just quick questions. One is, um, and if you hear a baby, it's my four-month-old who's saying hello. Um, but if the, the first is, um, do you have a timeline with respect to when your, your hospital will review what just came out, like you said, 36 hours ago, and come up with what will be your plan? Um, and then the second is, um, any public process or community process with respect to how your individual system does that? And then my last question is on notification. If, you know, God forbid, we have to uh, utilize uh, these standards, if we get to that point, and, and hopefully we'll, we will not, um, will your institution, and this will be my question for others as well, um, notify folks um, with respect to implementation of, of your systems um, uh, guidelines and standards? So, um, first of all, Councilwoman, um, say hello to your grand, you just uh, say hello to your son for us as well. Thank you. Um, <laughs> secondly, just uh, um, we met last night to review the, the re revised um, crisis standards of care. Um, we are studying them and, and looking at them and making a determination about next steps. I think it will probably take us a few days to get to the point where we make a decision about whether or not we would like to incorporate them or not. Secondly, in regard to your, dis your questions, we believe that every patient should have goals of care discussed with them literally on arrival. Some patients are going to choose that they would like to have um, less heroic measures instituted for them. Um, if they're 95 years old, if they have a terminal malignancy, they may wish to have comfort measures instituted as opposed to heroic measures. So every patient should have a goals of care discussion um, on arrival or soon after arrival to help identify their preferences when it comes to um, a discussion about the, the care that they would like invoked for them. Not every patient will want a ventilator and not every patient um, would choose to have a ventilator if one were offered for them. And again, we wanna make sure that we align um, the best care for that patient with what our resources are and make sure that we're delivering what they would in fact request. The third um, question that you spoke about is whether or not we would inform people. And we believe that every patient, if we invoke crisis standards of care across the Commonwealth, and we would hope that it would be a decision made across the healthcare system, not just steward, but if we got to the point in time where everyone was short on ventilators, we could make that discussion and that decision as a healthcare system, not one group of hospitals, but every group of hospitals together, um, coming together and saying, you know, we're getting close to being out of ventilators or we're at 90% utilization, it's time to have that discussion. Um, I think there are large working groups already that are currently in place that have come together, that are using sharing of best practices and sharing of equipment to make sure that we provide resources to one another when, when one of us is short. And yes, every individual, if crisis standards of care are going to be invoked, every individual should be informed that this is something that is, is about to occur and that they can expect that potentially crisis standards of care might be invoked during their treatment. That should be part of the informed consent process. And my last question is a follow-up based on what you said, Dr. Weinstein, which is if, you, if your system decides to incorporate those guidelines or not, right? So if you don't, do, do you currently have a copy of your crisis standards? So we have sure. a draft, I'm sorry. I'm not sure if Councillor Arroyo as a chair or if we've received no. a copy. Okay, because that would be helpful. So obviously you guys have your standards and you're, and you're gonna decide whether or not you're going to incorporate or, or follow any of the guidelines from the state, the revised guidelines. But I, I'm curious um, if you could share a copy of what the current standards are for the steward system. So Councilwoman, we don't have, we have a draft of the standards that we had developed and then we were waiting for the state Got it. Um, their first iteration and then again um, their second iteration came out Monday afternoon so we're looking at that I think we've tried to come up with an, a mechanism to review that and compare um, to where our draft was we will have something at some point for the Commission to look at um, what we have currently from internally is a draft document and we have not um, shared it because it's still in draft format and again thank goodness we've not had to get to the point in time We've not had the urgency to kind of make that decision. Again, we're using about 60 to 70% of our ventilators. We're nowhere near that 90% uh, 
um, threshold where we thought we would need to begin to invoke crisis standards of care. And then my last is just a comment. Thank you again for joining us and I wanna be mindful of my other colleagues. And, um, and if at some point, and this will be true for all the systems or hospitals, we would love to see a copy of this. We would love, whatever, whenever the finalized version is, because that's useful to the conversation in community as well, now that more people are paying attention uh, to these issues. Thank you, Dr. Weinstein, and um, thank you, uh, Council Royal. Thank you, uh, and just so folks have a heads up, uh, it's going to be Councillor Flynn, followed by Councillor Braden, followed by Councillor Flaherty. So Councillor Flynn, you, you now have the floor. Thank you, Councillor Royal, and uh, thank you to the uh, panelists for being here and for your incredible work. Um, Dr. Weinstein, I, I had a couple of questions. Um, I represent a large um, immigrant community, a large Asian community, Latinx community, and a lot of residents in public housing. Um, is, is there a way, um, I think, I think Councillor Campbell referenced it, but is there a way that we're able to pull the equipment that is needed um, so that there's one central location for the, this critical equipment and so then it gets doled out to a hospital that, that needs it and it's, and it's done in a fair process like that or, or is that more hospital by hospital? So I, I can only speak to how Stewart does it. So we obviously procure equipment as a system. Um, for example, we went out and bought, you know, a large number of ventilators and made sure we had them on hand. Um, I don't think you could cool them and put them in a central location. The decision about when a patient needs a ventilator is a decision that's made literally in minutes. And you couldn't necessarily transport a ventilator from a central location to one of our facilities, for example, in Methuen or Fall River or Dorchester or St. Elizabeth's with, with the ability of meeting that, that short time frame. One of the things we've learned in COVID-19 is that when these patients do deteriorate and decompensate and require um, a ventilator to help them breathe, that decision is made in minutes and the process of placing the breathing tube and placing them on a ventilator needs to be made in minutes as well. Um, I would not recommend placing them in a central location. I would be fearful that we would not necessarily meet the deadline of getting the ventilator to the patient in time. So. These ventilators are at individual hospitals, and I gave you in my opening statement how many we have at each hospital. And again, I, I would be reluctant to suggest that a central location for storage would be um, an acceptable format in this day and age. And my apologies. No, that's, that's good information. Thank you, doctor. And um, I, I think my last, um, my last question, um, doctor, was did we, did the medical community envision um, that there would be this type of breakdown in the system as it relates to equipment or the huge discrepancy um, along racial lines? I, I know we study that in public health, but now it's, now it's here and it's, it's, it's realistic. Um, were, were the, was the medical community actively preparing and studying for this type of scenario? So I think um, I can only speak to Stuart for our individual experience and say that once this came out of Asia, once we saw you know, evidence that Wuhan was going to be um, a central location for a pandemic, um, we began in very early January preparing for what we thought was an inevitability that this was going to be a um, pandemic that would affect the United States. Unlike um, SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome, and unlike MERS, which is the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome in 2002 and three, and then 2012 and 13. Those stayed in their geographic locations of, of Asia and then the Middle East. Once this kind of started to spread outside of China, once we saw it in Europe, it, it was in our minds inevitable that we were gonna see it in the United States. And so we began to prepare a long time ago um, in January for this. Many of us have been preparing for this for years um, I think people have been doing drills. Um, I think the rapidity with which it came, I think um, may have caught a few people off guard, but all of us, I think, have been working to make sure our institutions are prepared for mass casualty events, both mass traumas, similar to um, 
you know, 9-11 and, and Patriot's Day, you know, what happened here um, five years ago in Boston um, with the marathon bombings, but we've also been prepared for pandemics and getting ready so that we have the resources in place. Um, operationalizing those plans can always be a challenge, but I think we've all, um, and again, Stewart certainly has been getting ready for the likelihood that this at some point would occur. Thank, thank you. And that's uh, all I have, uh, Mr. Chair. Councillor Braden, followed by Councillor Flaherty, followed by Councillor Janey. Councillor Braden, do you have any questions? Um, thank you, um, Councillor Arroyo. Um, a quick question just with regard to um, the planning in, in an emergency situation under a lot of stress. Um, the notion that you have time to discuss the patient's wishes with them and their um, situation. I, I just wonder how, how, that's, how that happens in, in an emergency situation. Um, you talked about the, the plan that the patient's individualized plan of care, uh, depending on their health status. I know everyone's under incredible stress in, that situ in, in the present situation. Is that, do people have time to have those conversations at the moment, or is that something that you try and uh, chart in, if, if they're regular patients of yours, have you, have you got a system of charting that, that their, their end of life plans are, are documented? Thank so you. it's, you're welcome, and thank you again, ma'am. Um, so in many cases, um, there is a healthcare proxy form um, that we can identify within the chart. In some cases, a patient's wishes have been documented in the chart that they do not want to be on life-sustaining treatment. They do not want dialysis instituted. They may not want a ventilator. Um, for those patients who do not have any documentation of their wishes regarding life-sustaining treatment, it is important to have a goals of care discussion. We would not want to um, you know, perform um, putting breathing tube in a patient and putting them on life support if they did not want that. And again, um, every individual comes with a unique set of circumstances, with a unique set of how they would like to be cared for, and a unique set of what their expectations are regarding end of life care. And so um, you know, if you have a, a 95 year old individual who is you know, expressly set in their beliefs that they do not want life-sustaining care, it would be much um, worse for us to place a breathing tube into that individual than it would be to have that quick discussion um, and institute comfort measures to make sure that individual is um, treated in accordance with their wishes. And so I, I do think it's a combination of all of the above. It's looking at the chart, it's talking to the patient and the healthcare proxy, and again, making sure that we take into account an individual's wishes when we are um, beginning to treat them um, for an illness such as COVID-19 or any other life-threatening illness that they would present with. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for all your work. This is a really um, incredibly difficult time for all healthcare professionals and I appreciate it. Um, I think the, um, the, the situation with COVID in the sense that your immediate healthcare proxy or immediate caregiver or family member is not necessarily standing beside you as you discuss your plan of care with a doctor. It, it makes the whole situation even more difficult, I feel. You're absolutely correct. I think we've all been challenged by the fact that um, visitors have been um, relatively restricted from our hospitals because of the fact that we are trying to decrease the transmission of this disease. And so um, not having family members, not having visitors, not having those individuals standing at the bedside um, has made this even more challenging than it already is. And um, we certainly appreciate um, how difficult this is on patients. It's taken away one of their support mechanisms. And um, we understand that we need to, again, go the extra mile to either make that phone call or get in contact with those individuals who have input in regard to the treatment plan for the patient. Thank you. Thank you so much for your work. And I, I, I'm not taking any more time now. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I just want to acknowledge uh, that uh, we've been joined by Morgan McAllister from the community, uh, the League of Community Health Centers, and she'll also give statements. And again, for all the other panelists on the call, uh, after this first round with Dr. Joseph Weinstein, 
uh, we'll go back to the panelists uh, to individually present as well. Thank you for your patience. Uh, Councillor Flaherty, uh, followed by Councillor Janey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Obviously, I want to thank the uh, medical professionals uh, that uh, are on with us here today um, for the great work that they're doing and take this opportunity to dispel some of the Facebook rumors that the Boston City Council are trying to play the role as bioethicists and or trying to take over the ER um, in ICU decisions. We're going to leave that up to uh, the folks that uh, know that better than us, but this is an opportunity for us to have a, a discussion as to, uh, I guess, how decisions are made and uh, how moving forward uh, we could uh, encourage, uh, you know, that the the lens around equity uh, be placed on, on uh, you know, within our healthcare providers. So, uh, appreciate the, the attention to detail that you guys are playing on the front line, helping us with our COVID nineteen response. Cannot understand and you know appreciate the day to day uh, rigors that uh, you know all of our medical professionals and personnel are going through on a day to day basis. So. Uh, I felt thank you, um, you know, from uh, from me, obviously my colleagues, and, and, and the entire city, and uh, and much continued success as we're weathering through the surge. And I would just like to, while we have medical professionals on, just get someone's opinion on. Um, I know that as we're looking at uh, sort of the demographic and the ethnic breakdowns as to where this is impacting, I also want to make sure that we continue to put an emphasis on, on the antibody therapy uh, that that seems to be providing some results, but also we should be putting an emphasis on on those individuals and. I know it's hard to, uh, you know, when someone's been through it and they've gone through ICU and they've been on the ventilator and uh, they've come home, the last thing they want to do uh, a couple of weeks later is to return to, to donate, uh, you know, plasma and platelets, et cetera. But it, it is critical uh, that we encourage uh, those that have been uh, impacted and have suffered through COVID-19 to, to maybe uh, pay it forward, if you will, um, as a show of respect for our frontline responders to maybe make those donations so that uh, in the event uh, of others coming down with COVID-19 or if we get what some are expecting a potential boomerang effect where we, this thing comes back, we'll be in a better position uh, to fight. And so as much as it is about the data collecting and gathering of ex existing situations, it, you know, for me, it's, it's about life safety. It's about all of our people. It's making sure that uh, no matter who gets it, uh, gets uh, access to the most uh, and best available treatment. And, antibiotic therapy seems to be um, playing uh, big dividends and encouraging folks that have it uh, to participate and to, uh, to donate uh, that plasma is, is critical and would love to get your thoughts on that. And I think we need to track that as well as we continue to pour resources uh, in, into areas where we, we know that uh, we're seeing um, an increase and in uptick um, and, and for, for a variety of different reasons, which we're on this uh, Zoom to discuss. We also need to be putting an emphasis on uh, when uh, those patients recover that um, that they, they would be willing to pay it forward so that uh, fellow um, uh, uh, fellow citizens can have the benefit of of the antibody therapy that uh, will help them recover as well. So thank you for your time and attention. We look forward to hearing your answers. So um, first of all, thank you so much for your best wishes to all of the healthcare workers who are doing um, an incredible job on the front lines. Um, I believe that you're speaking about convalescent plasma, which again, is a, a pooled um, collection of serum to allow individuals to get the benefit of antibodies which they may have created. That does need to be given to individuals that are um, have the same blood type, so it can't be given. Um, if you're O positive, you can't give to someone who's B negative and vice versa. And it also usually requires at least 28 days from your recovery to make sure that you have enough antibodies that can be administered to other people. Um, we certainly are um, cautiously optimistic about the potential that convalescent plasma may have utility in the treatment of, of COVID-19. I'm sure you and other members of the council are aware that we don't have currently really effective treatment for this disorder. And that right now um, there's no you know, licensed approved antiviral therapy that is effective for it. Um, that many things are somewhat anecdotal and we really don't have any randomized clinical trials that show efficacy for, for a lot of different um, things that are being tried right now. Um, we're certainly looking forward to seeing data that would show that this is an effective form of therapy. And um, for right now, we certainly encourage anyone um, who is well enough um, at 28 days to be able to donate um, you know, their convalescent plasma so that it can be administered to individuals and hopefully um, effectuate a, a positive outcome for those people that are so sick. 
Um, again, we, we certainly encourage it. We're not in a position to mandate it. We're certainly not in a position to, um, to do anything other than to try to work with the Red Cross to make sure that when someone wants it, we try and get our hands on it to give it. Everything currently is being drawn by the American Red Cross, and there are randomized control trials, the largest of which is being overseen by Mayo Clinic. And again, we're hopeful to get some results um, that show that this is an effective form of therapy and show that um, it, it truly does improve outcomes for patients that are critically ill with COVID-19. Thank you, Doctor, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to listening to my colleagues as well as uh, the other medical professionals. Invite thank you. you. Uh, if I can just make a comment really briefly on uh, trying to keep the time short. We have a lot of medical professionals on hard stops and things of that nature. We're trying to make sure we get to all of them. So in terms of the questions, uh, you know, if we can just make sure that we're directing them and that if somebody else is able to lift it up, then that's great. Um, Councillor Janey, uh, followed by Councillor Stavi George. Uh, Council President Janey. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And first, I'd just like to thank uh, you and uh, your co-sponsor, Councillor Campbell, for bringing this important hearing order uh, fourth, I certainly want to thank all of the medical profess, uh, professionals, doctors, uh, nurses, others who may be on this call, administrators. Uh, thank you for all of the work that you're doing. I know how hard uh, everyone is working to, to deal with uh, this pandemic. Um, you know, I think this uh, conversation uh, really important and timely, and I, I hope we never get to a point where we have to make uh, decisions about who gets a ventilator and, and who doesn't. Um, I think what we have learned from all of our discussions around COVID, whether it be uh, looking at the economic impacts, whether looking at the impacts of uh, education and our, our school children, what we see is how um, COVID really is shining a spotlight on existing inequities. Um, and so, um, important that we have this conversation and that we understand that these inequities are, are baked into our system and that we didn't get here by accident when we're talking about groups of people who have pre-existing conditions, that those uh, conditions just didn't appear uh, by personal choice, but are conditions that are bred uh, in deep poverty. And so I just wanted to lift that up and I wonder um, as you do incredible work day to day dealing with this crisis, um, you know, what, um, what your thinking is. So kind of a follow up to uh, Councilor Royal's question around what, how do you consider when you're making these tough decisions in the moment, you know, what kind of information beyond the health of, of the patient um, are you considering when you're thinking about uh, whether or not they can recover within a time frame. And then I just wonder well, which of your institutions are tracking <clears throat> uh, data um, by race and, and by neighborhood and by language. Um, and and I, I know, I think we are just uh, hearing from Dr. Weinstein. So if there are others who need to respond later, that's fine. I'd um, be interested in responses to those. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, first of all, thank you so much, Councilwoman, for, for your comments. I, I just wanted to basically say a few things in terms of, of this. So number one, this continues, thank goodness, to be a hypothetical discussion. We have not had to, um, at this point in time, and certainly given that we believe we're at the peak or near the surge uh, of patients, we do not believe at this point in time that we will have to come to crisis standards of care to making a decision regarding allocating scarce medical resources um, between patients and making a decision that one patient is more deserving than another patient. I will say that in all of the um, ethical documents that basically look at this, um, there are many different determinants that individuals have used. Some look at short-term mortality. We talked a little bit about SOFA, which is, um, again, an organ failure assessment score. Um, that basically predicts um, likelihood of surviving the patient's hospitalization. Um, that's commonly used when patients are admitted to any intensive care unit. We, we look you know, at age, we look at 
um, other things that basically can come into play. But again, these are all hypothetical. And again, I would just make sure that everyone understands we are not, thank goodness, in a position where we have to make a decision about um, the deciding who should get an essential form of therapy, one person versus another, in large part because, you know, um, the Department of Public Health, um, Governor Baker and others have really done an incredible job of making sure that we've had access to the federal stockpiles. Um, he's made sure that ventilators have been distributed from um, the, the state stockpile to our institutions. And again, many of us have been working for months um, making sure that our individual institutions and our systems had the appropriate resources to ensure that we did not get ourselves into a position where we had to make a determination, um, you know, one person versus another who was more deserving of, of care. Those are discussions like King Solomon had, you know, trying to figure out who's more deserving. And again, we hope that we never, ever, ever get to those type of discussions and those type of decisions. Yeah, and I, I certainly share that. And I hope I was clear uh, as I asked the question that I, I'm, I'm grateful and hope that we never get there. Let me ask this question then, and this will be my final, Mr. Chair. Um, in terms of what we currently have, um, just looking at uh, inventory, um, particularly around ventilators, is there um, a, a cushion that institutions like to see when it comes to um, the number of uh, patients in ICU that might need a ventilator and how many you actually have? Is there like a, a certain cushion that you like to see and how close are we to that? So um, we talked about two different metrics. One is percent utilization of your ventilators. When you get to 90% utilization of your available ventilators, um, that's clearly when I think most of us um, become very concerned about you know, how we're going to either get additional ventilators very quickly, i.e. accessing the federal stockpile, borrowing from other institutions, or you know, getting additional orders in from manufacturers. That's one metric is percent utilization of your available ventilators. The other is we'd like to make sure we absolutely always have one ventilator at times like this during global pandemics for every ICU bed and for every potential ICU bed. So we want to make sure that we have a cushion. Um, sometimes the ventilator may not always work well, and sometimes you have to switch it out. But we want to make sure you have, uh, again, you know, at least 100% um, for all your ICU beds having ventilators for all of those. And then when you get to, in our minds, when you get to 90% utilization of ventilators, that's when you have to make a decision, are we going to go get more quickly? Or are we going to have to begin to think about um, you know, how to allocate a resource that is, is finite and if you don't have it? Again, the governor, the Department of Public Health, Secretary Sutters, and others have been great about making sure that we've had access to the federal stockpiles. Um, they've been able to give out ventilators you know, to any institution that has had a need. Um, and, and again, um, we're very grateful to the governor for his leadership and, and again, the secretary for her leadership, the Department of Public Health and others, because we have not again, gotten even remotely close to the point where we've had to do this. The statistics I gave in my opening, we're at about 55 to 60% utilization of available ventilators. So we're not even close to the point where we would have to make that decision. Thank you, President Janey. Uh, Councillor Asabi George, followed by uh, Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the entire panel for being here. Um, doctor, if you could just uh, refresh me on those, those percentage of utilization numbers, is it 50 to 60 or 15 to 16? We're at about 50 to 60% utilization of our available ventilators at both. Is that across, is that across, I'm sorry, is that across the system? Pretty close across the system. We're at those numbers both at both St. Elizabeth's and Kearney, and we're pretty much at those numbers across our system as well. We have we have significant available ventilators that we could access, both invasive and non-invasive ventilators. That's great. I appreciate that, and thank you um, for those numbers. And also, it's helpful to understand that 90% number is that sort of the critical tipping point. Other than ventilators, what are the um, what are the other components that we see as significant numbers to watch around utilization? So again, there's not really a medication that we can use for this. Although in other situations, I think we would be looking for medicines. We have seen 
some shortages of some critical care medications. So um, fentanyl, which has sometimes been as a dirty word for the fact that it's been abused, it's a very common critical care medication used to sedate and treat patients. We've seen some shortages of fentanyl. We've seen some shortages of propofol. Um, but again, we, we've gotten more than adequate resources um, lately. And, and again, we never got to the point where those medications were in shortage. We have seen some shortages of neuromuscular blockade, which are medications that um, get a patient's muscles to relax and stop fighting the ventilator and allow the ventilator to do the work for the patient. Again, currently no shortage of those medications as well. Um, again, we don't have an antibiotic or an antiviral therapy, so there's no shortage there. But the councilman earlier did mention that convalescent um, plasma is, is in short supply for those patients that need it. And again, that's not something that the healthcare system can provide. It actually comes from patients who, again, have the same blood type and are 28 days or more out from their infection. Um, that I think would be the biggest thing we would love to be able to get our hands on. And then I'll be frank in that we need a vaccine for this. If we don't have a vaccine, um, there's been talk about a potential recurrence of this disease. And I think we're all very concerned about what that could look like. And I think we also need additional testing capabilities. I think you've heard probably um, in, in lay press, we don't think that there's enough testing capability across the United States for this disease. Is there, is there an effort through your um, hospital system and your patients to be advocating, as Councillor Flaherty mentioned, for that uh, convalescent um, blood donation? So again, convalescent serum has to be 28 days or more out from the acute infection. Thank goodness most of our patients have left our hospital by the time that occurs. And so we certainly encourage, but um, most of those patients have left our care and hopefully are either at home um, recovering or in a, an acute care facility, a subacute or an acute care facility getting um, their care at that point in time. Great, thank you. I appreciate, um, appreciate your being with us today. I know on short time and uh, limited time. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Uh, and so the last, well, the next two, Councillor O'Malley uh, and then Councillor Mejia, and then uh, we're gonna kick it over to the panel of doctors. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I will be uh, brief. It's more important, I think, we hear from uh, some of these really talented uh, health professionals. So first and foremost, uh, I know all my colleagues join me in thanking you for your exceptional service during this incredibly difficult time. Um, thank you, particularly Dr. Weinstein, for this first round of uh, overview. Very sobering indeed. Um, and just certainly, again, reinforces the magnitude of what we are up against. Uh, no further questions. I uh, look forward to hearing from the uh, subsequent panels. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor O'Malley. And then uh, I believe uh, Dr. Weinstein had a 3 p.m. hard stop. So the final uh, questioner here is uh, Councillor Mejia. Hello, can you see me? Can Sorry, you uh, Councillor Wu followed by, uh, Councillor Wu followed by Councillor Mejia. Sorry about that. Councillor Wu. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I. I know time is tight and my, my colleagues have asked great questions. So I just want to say thank you um, for saving lives. We so appreciate you and um, are grateful for your insights. I'll continue to support this effort. Thank you, Councillor Wu. Councillor Mejia. Hi, can you, I'm having a little bit of difficulty. Yep, no, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, so I understand the time crunch. Thank you again for hosting this. I do have several questions though. Um, Mine are specifically around um, language access. I'm curious as to whether or not what support systems are in place for folks who may not um, understand the language when they are, um, when you're interacting with patients. Um, there was recent, recently a, an article that we came across in our office um, in ProRepublic in regards to uh, folks who were having issues with language access and some who unfortunately passed. And so I'm just curious as to how the hospitals are dealing with the issues of language access here. And then the other piece that I'm really um, curious about is um, there's, there's a lot of uh, lack of trust with government and institutions 
and and with great reason, right? It's hard to believe that oftentimes that people are going to have our best interest. And while we re we really do appreciate that these guidelines are if if in case of emergency, I'm just wondering what type of communication um, you're sharing with communities and particularly communities of color to help them understand that. Um, that we're doing our dual diligence to ensure that they're gonna get uh, the support and the services and the equipment that they need, um, regardless of some of the, of the uh, issues that we've come across in terms of uh, the mortality uh, rates um, issues. So I am, I'm, not, I'm not sure how I feel about this time constraint because I do have other questions that I wanna ask, but I'm gonna be mindful of that. Um, Councilor Arroyo and reserve the rest of my questions for the next go round. Sure, so let me just address um, the, the questions you asked and I can certainly stay on for a few more minutes if you need me to. Number one, we have a robust, um, re very robust um, use of interpreter services. Um, we basically have um, interpreters currently in person that speak many different languages and we have the ability to access over a hundred different languages using um, either iPads or telephone access to make sure that we can um, get someone who speaks the dialect in Chinese or whatever other language that we may not have an interpreter for in person. But certainly um, we, we have interpreter services for the vast um, majority of the, the languages that patients present with, certainly in the communities that um, we're working in, we are very aware of, of those languages and we have interpreter services in person um, that allow for an individual to communicate adequately with a physician, especially when we're talking about important aspects like goals of care. Okay. Secondly, when it comes to um, some of the, the comments you were making about institutions, I think um, we believe very strongly that um, an institution needs to reflect its community. And again, we're located in um, socioeconomically disadvantaged communities. We're in Brockton, we're in Taunton, we're in Fall River, we're in Dorchester. Um, we don't have hospitals in very affluent communities. And so um, we believe that we are very much a reflection of the communities that we serve. And we believe strongly that um, we have both people in our communities that work at our hospitals and we have patients that we serve that we feel strongly that we represent the values that they're looking for. So I guess I would um, just say that while trust may be difficult, um, to, to basically have out of the gate. It's something that's earned over time. And we believe that our institutions by being longstanding members of the, these communities, um, again, each one of which is unique, um, basically by virtue of uh, both employees and patients being very comfortable at these institutions, we believe that we have gradually earned their respect and their trust and that we work to continue to maintain that. Thank you for that. And then just one quick follow-up. I'm just curious in terms of um, the role that, um, see, like can, excuse me, Counselor Janie mentioned earlier in terms of, or I, my, my, it may have been um, Counselor Campbell in regards to um, just really understanding the language and how accessible it is for um, guidelines. I'm just wondering whether or not there was an opportunity for community input. I know for me, I have to Google half the things that come out of um, certain spaces um, just so that I can understand them. So just curious in terms of the cultural competency, not just in terms of language um, access and translation, but really just the tone and, and just the, the, the information and being able to um, be shared in ways that um, the everyday person can actually understand it. Just wondering what that looked like in terms of your process. So again, when we developed our own internal document, we clearly had, um, again, people from different cultural backgrounds as part of our committee that um, helped develop the internal draft document. Again, it's, it's not been finalized and it certainly is not something that we have put in place. The document developed by the Department of Public Health, the Crisis Standards of Care, I believe there was 20, 25 people that were involved in um, the um, the drafting of that document. And I, I will be honest, Councilwoman, I, I cannot speak to the cultural diversity of those individuals. I don't know many of them um, by name, and I certainly don't know their, their cultural backgrounds to be able to speak to that. So I, I would ask that um, either I can certainly do research and get back to you, or would ask that you 
um, direct that question to someone who can answer it in a better fashion for you. Yeah, that, that would be great. I would be curious to know, and it's not just around the cultural uh, backgrounds. I'm also curious about their, the economic back, you know, economic status and also their reading levels. I think that all of those things need to be taken into consideration as well. Thank you. You're welcome, ma'am. Thank you, Councillor Mejia. Uh, and so with that, I'm now going to hand it over to our doctors who are on uh, on this conference uh, call here, uh, as well as Morgan Callister uh, from the uh, community, uh, legal community health centers. Uh, starting with uh, Dr. Uh, Alistair Martin, uh, and just to give you a brief uh, intro on how to do this, um, I'm gonna try and go from doctor to doctor to doctor here. Uh, introduce yourself uh, as you, uh, what coalition or how, what you're representing and what uh, what you'd like to say in terms of the guidelines and what you're seeing. And then I'll open it up after we've had all of you speak to the counselors and they can ask the questions to the group as a whole. At that point, if you raise a hand or if you raise the blue hand on Zoom, I'll know you would like to answer that question and we'll just have it done that way. So thank you everybody for being here. I appreciate you. I don't wanna take up more time. So uh, Dr. Martin. First of all, thank you, Chairman, and to the City Councilors for providing the opportunity to speak today and is shining light on what is an incredibly important issue. Uh, my name is Alistair Martin, and I'm an ER physician and a member of the Mass Coalition on Health Equity. Our group represents 80 physicians across five major Boston hospitals, and we came together for a simple purpose, to speak out against the administration's crisis standards of care that we felt would unfairly bias against communities of color and those with disabilities. The very communities that are most impacted by COVID-19. Our coalition started open letters that to date have collected the signatures of over a thousand physicians, nurses, social workers, and frontline staff. In response to our advocacy and the advocacy of dozens of other groups across the Commonwealth, the administration released updated guidelines on April 20th. We are here today to say that these revised guidelines are a step in the right direction, but not the final destination on our journey towards true health equity. The original document stated that quote unquote, underlying medical illnesses would count against you, that you would get points for diseases like diabetes and heart failure, which some Massachusetts hospitals considered using to help determine who got a ventilator and who did not. Many of those diseases considered were found at higher rates in communities of color, giving them more points and less access to a ventilator. The new guidelines have updated language, and while the shift away from inclusion of underlying medical illnesses to a more narrow framing of underlying conditions is helpful, these guidelines still do not go far enough to truly protect marginalized populations like communities of color and uh, patients with disabilities. Our representatives here today will address the areas that still need critical attention. And I'll take the first one. And that's around the fact that the guidelines still factor in patients' medical his history. And that medical history and medical illness um, factor is counted against you in the decision of whether or not you get a ventilator. This set of guidelines does that in the form of a quote unquote major list and a severe list. These, uh, this major list is supposed to reference diseases that could lead to death in five years. Now we will get into why this is vague and obscure and nothing more than a transparent attempt for false reassurance. But furthermore, the guidelines still leave it up to hospitals to decide what their specific diseases will be on that list that will count against patients. This is troubling because it invites variability between uh, what hospitals will consider as diseases that will and will not be considered as factors that will deny patients life-saving resources. That variability in principle means that a patient who needs a ventilator may be denied at one hospital, but could very well be given a ventilator at another hospital simply because of the diseases which each hospital chose to consider. That's unclear, that's unfair, and we can do better. Thank you, Dr. Martin. I uh, appreciate that. I'm now going to go to uh, Dr. Wendy Macias, and I'm sorry, I, I love to make sure that I'm pronouncing names correctly, so I'm going to do my best here. Constantopoulos, is that correct? Uh, yes, I think I'm going to defer, if I may, uh, to Hazar Kadir, one of my colleagues, 
who is next on uh, the dock to uh, speak, if that's You may, and actually just because you're as a panel, if uh, when you finish speaking, if you could just say who, who is next in the in the docket for y'all, that would be great, great. Um, and then we can make it easier. Um, and just to be clear, Dr. Martin, if thank you so much. Dr. Martin, uh, thumbs up if you were complete. I, I didn't want to cut you off if you weren't. Okay, great. Dr. Hazar Kadir. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Councilman, for um, allowing me to speak and um, join in uh, our very robust discussion around this really important topic. Um, so the revisions to the guidelines um, that were released by the Department of Public Health a few days ago state um, that those who develop and oversee institutional crisis standards of care protocols should reflect the full diversity of our communities. They go on to say, to the extent possible, triage officers and triage teams who are um, for everyone to kind of be on the same page are actually the individuals within um, specific institutions who will be deciding which patients get critical care resources. Those, um, those individuals, uh, those teams should include members that adequately represent the diversity of the patient populations served by the hospital. Again, they say that to the extent possible, they should um, reflect the diversity of the patient populations. So we believe that these changes fall short for three main reasons. The language that's used um, around diverse perspectives is framed um, as to the extent possible. Uh, I think we can all recognize that this is vague. It creates a loophole that would relieve hospitals of strict obligations to ensure diversity. And so we believe that um, this statement fall short because the DPH should ensure that hospitals are required to achieve adequate representation of the diversity of their communities. This is not an option and should not be done half-heartedly. Secondly, there is no explicit instructions on what constitutes adequate representation on triage and oversight committees. Um, we know that the demographic makeup of institutions can vary dramatically. The cultures and resources of institutions can also be even more variable. Um, and we are all lucky um, as a part of the Massachusetts uh, Coalition on Health Equity to, be, to practice at institutions that have you know, long established committees and centers whose whole purpose is to ensure diversity, inclusion, and to fight for health justice. But we also recognize that there are hospitals that may not have existing systems to address health equity and diversity issues. There may also be institutions that may not have um, an adequate pool of uh, people of color to represent the diversity of their communities. So um, the last point I wanna make about, about that um, is specifically with regard, regarding to just picking people of color from a, you know, the pool of available people within institutions. We all know as, um, as some of us are, are people of color um, that people of color are historically at risk of tokenism um, where their race or ethnicity is exploited as a check mark for meeting metrics, but their agency to advocate for their communities in an authentic way is hindered by institutional norms and by institutional power structures. So this really challenges the main purpose of establishing diversity within these teams um, that are gonna be operating and leading crisis uh, standards of care um, rollout in, 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 you know, in, a, in the theoretical situation that they have to be invoked. And um, in hindering the diversity initiatives, uh, we're also hindering our, um, our efforts to bolster and ensure health equity um, in critical resource allocation. So uh, for those reasons, we believe that the Department of Public Health needs to add substance to the stated commitment to achieving adequate representation by providing explicit guidance to hospitals on how they should recruit diverse members to their um, crisis standards of care committees and provide them support in um, establishing diversity within these committees. Lastly, there is no method of accountability related to ensuring diversity within institutional crisis standards of care committees. So the DPH just provides this recommendation, uh, also says to the extent possible, so it creates an out, an um, avenue uh, for these institutions to essentially not comply uh, with this recommendation. Uh, and then there's no method to follow up to determine whether um, institutions do have adequate um, diversity and representation that is in proportion to the communities that they serve. Um, and because robust and authentic representation is critical to ensuring equity, the Department of Public Health should institute a system to check that triage review and oversight teams are adequately representative of the demographic communities that they serve. And then related to this issue of tokenism that we brought up, 
there should also be a confidential process that will allow triage officers to blow the whistle on concerns around equity and disparities without fear of repercussions from their institutions. And the whole function of adding the substance to the stated commitment within the updated guidelines uh, is to try to create a more robust structure and to ensure that um, we do actually achieve um, diversity uh, across all hospitals um, across the uh, Massachusetts and not just at institutions like ours where we already have a structure system and resources um, to provide, um, to bolster diversity inclusion and to champion health equity around critical resource allocation. So with that, I'm, um, I'm gonna actually pass on the, um, the mic to one of my colleagues, um, Omi, who's gonna be talking about um, essential worker preference. And that's uh, Dr. Akai, correct? Yes. Dr. A.K., uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Onyechi A.K. I'm an ER a physician, also here with the Massachusetts Coalition on Health Equity. Thank you all for having us. Per the guidelines, if multiple patients have the same priority score and life cycle considerations are similar, then participation in public health response and maintenance of societal order will be used in assigning priority. Determining who would be considered as critical in public health response or maintaining societal order is too vague of a guideline and is open to bias. Some may overlook custodial staff, grocery store clerks, bus drivers, and sanitation workers, all of whom we all know provide essential services while placing themselves at risk. In addition, Unemployed people are also maintaining societal order and should not be considered to be of a lesser value. More than 22 million people in the US have filed for unemployment benefits. We erode public trust by communicating that in times of crisis, when many have lost their jobs while still caring for family, friends, and neighbors, some of whom are sick, elderly, or disabled, that we will use employment status as a criteria for deciding who gets critical care resources. If equity is important in our state's guidelines, then prioritizing one life over another on the grounds of employment description violates the ethical principle of justice. This will further worsen inequities that we already see in our society. Therefore, the guidelines should not include employment type or status as a criteria for resource allocation. Thank you. I will now turn to my colleague, Dr. Otugo. Doc, thank you. Uh, Dr. Otugo, I'm going to unmute you now. Oh, hold on. There you go. You should be unmuted. There you go. Thank you, Dr. Otugo. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. My name is Anyaka Otugo, and I'll be talking about the five-year survival. So the, re the revisions use a five-year survival as a criteria for allocation. Defining five-year survival is difficult. It is unclear how you standardize five-year survivability. Does the physician decide? Does a triage officer decide? Is the government supposed to decide? This could lead to a subjective interpretation. Attempting to standardize five-year survival is the state giving a false sense of security. Firstly, as others have stated, this kind of estimate is honestly just a guess, particularly in a crisis like this. This estimate ends up reflecting broad stereotypes of an individual's diagnosis. There are tens of thousands of people walking around today who are told that they had less than five years to live, 10, 20, or even 30 years ago. Secondly, even if those estimates are accurate, five years is a long time. It's long enough to see your kids grow up to finish your life's work, and to do all the things that we value as a society. If we allow our government to say that the lives of such people are worthless, it will have disastrous implications. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Otugo. Uh, going back to Dr. Martin, uh, Dr. Johnson was with us. Uh, sorry, Dr. Andrew Marshall was with us uh, and had to leave. Dr. Uh, Martin is going to cover his portion. You're Thanks unmuted. You, Phil. Um, but the point is simple. To better understand what's driving this epidemic, we need better data. And it was only with the release of the initial demographic information tied to COVID-19 
that we started to better understand how it was affecting our vulnerable communities. To ensure that the allocation of the resources in a crisis is equitable, we need to do two things. First, we must build models to test the scoring systems that we propose. We must examine the factors we are using to score patients carefully, including comorbid conditions, to ensure that they are not causing overrepresentation or underrepresentation of any group of patients that may need a scarce resource. Second, we need clear requirements for monitoring allocation of scarce resources. The CSC guidelines as of the 20th of April outlines that the public will need access to up-to-date, accurate, and transparent use of CSC. Although the revised guidelines do specify that demographic information will be released to DPH at their request, we believe that this data should be made publicly available and in real time so that inequities can be quickly identified and interventions for at-risk communities can be effectively targeted. I'm going to pass it over to our colleague, Dr. Lana Habash. Dr. Lana Habash, you are now unmuted. Uh, one second, you're not unmuted. One second. Now you are unmuted. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank um, you. Sorry, I was having technical difficulties with my video for some reason, um, but that's fine. Um, uh, council, uh, thank you, um, Chairman Arroyo and um, uh, members of the Boston City Council for inviting us. My name is Lana Havish. I'm a family physician who's been working in the Boston community for over 20 years, and I'm a member of the Massachusetts Coalition on Health Equity. Um, you've already heard how the revised crisis standards of care will negatively impact access to life-saving care for many communities in Boston, including indigenous people, black people, Latinx people, other communities of color, elders, immigrants, asylees, refugees, and those who are undocumented documented, uninsured, incarcerated, homeless, experiencing poverty or living with disabilities. These communities already suffer from significant health disparities as a result of structural racism, economic injustice, and ableism. The crisis standards as currently written will still intensify these disparities. The original crisis standards of uh, care advisory committee was composed of 16 people. Not one of these people was from the black, Latinx, Haitian, or Cape Verdean community. Not one represented the interests of undocumented, uninsured, homeless, or incarcerated people. Not one represented the interests of low-income families. It was only after public advocacy that the committee was reconvened to revise the standards. In response to the demand for community oversight, one member was added to the committee, just one. While a step in the right direction, this is not community oversight. We can do better. For there to be equity in healthcare and crisis response, communities most impacted by COVID-19 must be centrally involved in developing the government policies that will impact their lives. Tokenism won't create equity, but community participation will. True community oversight will require transparency of decision-making processes, public access to real-time demographic data, public access to real-time hospital resource data, community participation in the creation of just standards that account for health disparities, and hospital triage committees with community membership that is representative of the population and has real decision-making power. Boston has a long history of communities creatively solving community problems. We will continue to demand accountability from our state and local government until life-saving care and resources are justly and equitably allocated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Wendy Macias Constantinopoulos, I believe, is next. Uh, you can, there you are, you are muted. Thank you, council members. Um, thank you for having us and allowing us to lend our voice and shine a light on the concerns of the communities we collectively represent today. My name is uh, Dr. Wendy Macias Constantopoulos. I'm an emergency physician, been serving the greater Boston area for approximately 17 years, and I'm a member of the Massachusetts Coalition on Health Equity. Um, while we're grateful to the advisory committee and to the state uh, for their reconsideration of the crisis standards of care guidelines, the new version released on April 20th um, continues to uh, continues to have some potential loopholes and blind spots 
that we would like to highlight and that we have done so today. Of greatest concern is the vast gray zone that has been created by the vagueness around which comorbidities qualify as major underlying conditions versus those that qualify as severely life-limiting conditions. Um, this non-specific language creates a lot of room for um, variability. Qualifiers such as to the extent possible or if available and feasible also provides non-specific language that allows for too much room for variability. While it may have the appearance of being a reasonable approach in times of crisis, it simply leaves room for variable and uneven and biased interpretation and application of the standards. Standardization of an equitable process for allocating critical care resources should be the ultimate goal and variations should be minimized if not limited, eliminated. Loopholes and blind spots stand to exacerbate inequalities. We have the opportunity here to use this time in our history to course correct the injustices and disparities that have been centuries in the making, to ensure that our systems close the health gap and rise to meet the needs of all our communities. We must safeguard against procedures and policies that will intensify the very structural disparities that had led to the uneven playing field on which we stand today and which complicates the process of invoking crisis standards. To conclude, we cannot in good conscience allow for the burden of any pandemic to fall disproportionately on those individuals and communities who already carry the heavy burden of health disparities. The process of allocating scarce intensive care resources must account for the uneven distribution of health in our society an inequality that results from the seemingly normal and hidden layers of historic and, system, and systematic injustices and the resultant unequal distribution of social, political, and economic empowerment. Ultimately, for crisis standards of care to be considered ethical, fair, just, and equitable, they must be developed transparently and with the input from the communities they threaten to disproportionately impact. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh I believe next uh, we have Dr. Chichewitz. You're not unmuted. Um, can we actually start with uh, Dr. Radhika Jane? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jane, if you are able to unmute, ah, there you are. You're now unmuted. Thank you, Dr. Jane. Um, my name is Radhika Jane. I am a second year resident physician in the Department of Medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, and together with Dr. Lasanu and Dr. Chikowitz, I represent um, a group of residents at MGH and the Brigham and Women's Hospital who are part of the COVID-19 resident working group on equity. Um, we, uh, actually me personally, for the last month, I've been taking care of patients uh, with lung, kidney, and heart failure due to COVID-19 in our medical intensive care units. And many of our residents across uh, both hospitals and many hospitals in the partner system are taking care of patients who have been affected by COVID-19. And so we bring to this conversation a real urgency based on our clinical experiences in the last few weeks. Um, we've already heard from many of the physicians on this hearing uh, the very real reasons why uh, we worry that a critical scarcity of essential life-saving resources may inadvertently exacerbate existing inequities um, under the current crisis standards of care. Uh, but even though, um, as Dr. Weinstein mentioned, luckily we haven't reached a point of reaching a scarcity of those ventilators, we do see on the wars on a daily basis, even limitations in our basic supplies. Um, and so I think that thinking about these crisis standards of care an equitable allocation of resources is important even now, and we must maintain urgency in this setting. Um, we recognize that designing a system that both maximizes life save but also prioritizes equity is not easy. Um, and we really do applaud the efforts of the Commonwealth and the city of Boston to critically and thoughtfully edit and amend the crisis standards of care. And we hope and encourage that that um, iterative process and editing and um, critique continues. Uh, we are grateful for the changes that have already been made um, and also want to say that we 
represent a broad coalition of providers, both doctors, nurses, medical students, social workers, um, administrative managers across the partner system. We're really concerned about these crisis standards of care. More than 600 of our uh, healthcare workers signed a letter encouraging more consideration of equity in these standards. Um, I want to turn it over to Dr. Chikowitz and Dr. Lasanu to talk more about a couple of specific suggestions that we have um, that will amplify some of the suggestions already made uh, by the physicians who have spoken before us. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, Dr. Chikowitz. Yes, my, my name is Cody Chikowitz, and I'm a first-year resident at uh, Mass General Hospital and a member of the Internal Medicine Program and Global Health Equity Program. Uh, and like Radhika, for the last month, I've been taking care of patients with coronavirus and have seen firsthand how this uh, pandemic has really uh, propagated through our most vulnerable communities and had significant impacts, not only on our patients, but their families and loved ones. Uh, and so I'm really grateful for the opportunity to testify. Uh, we stand in unity with many of the other physicians that are testifying today uh, in calls for more specificity to the guidelines that have been released. Specifically, I'd like to talk about the data collection uh, from hospitals in the state uh, that are recommended by the current guidelines. Currently, uh, as mentioned earlier, the guidelines state that there will be a retrospective review should the CSC guidelines be implemented. We believe that data reporting should be more clearly defined. It should be actionable and timely. Specifically, we suggest that data um, be released on a daily or weekly basis, if daily not possible, that includes detailed demographic information, including race, ethnicity, disability status, primary language that's spoken, and the nine digit zip code for patients that are admitted to the hospital with both presumed and confirmed COVID cases, whether or not the crisis standards of care are activated. Uh, we believe that this will help us identify whether or not resources are utilized in patients' courses uh, in an equitable fashion. These data should be made publicly available de-identified in an aggregate format, so there's transparency for the communities that are most affected. We also recognize that while the CSC might not get activated, there are other resources and therapies in our hospitals that may become sparse during these, this pandemic. Any data that's reported should not only be on the crisis standards of care, but other things that include access to things like dialysis, clinical trials, drugs released from the FDA under compassionate use, and preferred medications that may be needed in the ICU. We want to ensure that equity is extended to these situations as well. Finally, we've seen great variability in the quality of the data reported from the state, with many participant or many patients having missing or unknown demographic information. It is essential that the state and city oversee data collection and push for quality so that we can act appropriately and get resources to our most marginalized communities. And with that, I'll pass that off to uh, Desto Lasano. Dr. Lasano, you are now unmuted. Hi, thank you. My name is Desta Lasano. I'm a first year resident physician in the Department of Psychiatry at the combined Mass General McLean program. I cared for COVID positive patients on a surge floor in late March when we were first beginning to see how this virus was devastating vulnerable communities. Starting next week, I will be working at McLean Hospital, where I'll be working with patients with severe mental illness. Many of these patients take medications that increase their risk for developing obesity, diabetes, and heart disease, conditions that we know increase their risk for having a severe COVID infection. It is these patients and other vulnerable patients that I fear may be left behind in discussions of crisis standards of care. I'm grateful to be here to have the opportunity to lend my voice on their behalf. My colleagues have already made excellent points regarding the shortcomings of the crisis, standard of, crisis standards of care as are already worded. For my part, I wanna add my voice um, to underline the point about ensuring diverse representation on all committees working on the development, implementation, and assessment of these standards of care um, at the state, hospital, and city level. Given the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on marginalized communities, it's essential communities have a voice and a seat at the table when allocation of resources is being decided. I will echo many here who've already said that we have to be explicit about who is present in these discussions. And we must ensure racial language diversity as well as inclusion of leaders 
um, who are experts in health equ equity and social justice. When I think about the patients I was taking care of, people who represent our most vulnerable communities in Boston, it's hard not to imagine people from those communities getting to have a voice in how scarce resources are allocated. Finally, we call for implicit bias training for all individuals who are writing crisis standards of care and making triage decisions. The state of Massachusetts and the city of Boston um, has a real opportunity here to set the tone for crisis standards of care across the country, as well as to facilitate equitable decision making across Massachusetts diverse hospitals. And I hope that these recommendations will be a good step toward making that goal a reality. Thank you so much. Uh, and now uh, Morgan McAllister, who is here representing the uh, League of Community Health Centers, uh, if you can please uh, give your testimony. Thank you so much for being here and thank you for your patience. Thank you, Chairman Arroyo and members of the council. My name is Morgan McAllister. I'm an analyst in the Governmental Affairs and Public Policy Division of the Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers. I'm testifying today in place of Michael Curry, our Deputy CEO of the Mass League. To give some background on who we are, the Mass League represents 52 community health server, uh, centers serving over a million patients. Um, out of over 314 practice sites throughout the Commonwealth, 22 of which are located right here in the city of Boston. This is the birthplace of community health centers, which were born out of the civil rights movement, aimed at responding to the generations of health inequity, disparate treatment, neglect, and abuse that have tainted our country's healthcare system. These inequities persist today, and community health centers remain on the front lines uh, over 50 years later, serving communities with higher rates of diabetes, heart disease, asthma, and a host of other illnesses. We provide medical, dental, behavioral health, vision, and substance use services, as well as other social services to one and two residents in the city of Boston. Our patients come from diverse racial and economic backgrounds and are being disparately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And as recent data reveals in Boston, in the Commonwealth and across the country, our patients are at higher risk of testing positive and losing their lives to this disease. So the League is here to join the chorus of voices challenging any crisis standard of care that would cause our patients to be denied life-saving measures due to scoring factors based on pre-existing health conditions, comorbidities, or long-term survivability. We challenge any standard that fails to benefit at its conception from diverse voices and perspectives. Um, it ha this has unintended, co unintended consequences of denying any member in the communities that we serve of their right to life and their right to our world-class medical technology and care that could prevent them from succumbing to this disease. We also challenge any standard that will result in more individuals of color losing their lives in this pandemic based on our collective failure to address the societal ill of racism. Sadly, this is our Katrina moment where inequities are laid bare and the policy decisions that we make will determine the number of patients we must watch fall victim to this virus. The League is a participant in the Massachusetts Public Health Association and its Health Equity Task Force. Our deputy CEO serves on the COVID-19 Health Inequities Task Force and is working with the Department of Public Health to address inequity issues. We encourage strongly this body to ask the critical questions, challenge any policies, and lend its voice against any standard of care that will be discriminatory. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Uh, and so with that, uh, that concludes the panel's opening presentation. Uh, we're gonna open it up to questions from the council. Uh, before we do that, uh, I just wanna uh, commend everybody uh, who has taken time uh, to put together the things that you put together today uh, over and over during your presentation. I thought to myself about how powerful it is to have you here raising these issues. You're, you're doing heroes work in, in our hospitals and you're doing heroes work out of them. Um, and so uh, please take that sincerely from me that uh, as somebody who, as, as the only man of color, frankly, on the city council, as somebody who wishes uh, that there was somebody from the administration present for this hearing uh, or that there was somebody representative of many of the hospitals that you work at here for this hearing uh, to speak to these issues and to tell us specifically what guidelines they are following, what their, what their impact is. I want you to understand that as you speak to us, uh, you are also speaking to the public. And in, in this work that I've done, I have found that light is the best disinfectant when you do bring these issues out, when you bring voice to them, you bring voice to so many others. And so thank you so much for this work and, and, the, and the challenges that you're facing and making these changes happen. And please do uh, consider me a partner in any way that I can be 
in the work that you are continuing to do. So thank you very much to all our panelists. Um, and with that said, I, I do think you gave us a lot there to work with, uh, and I deeply appreciate that. Um, my question, and this is to the panel as a whole, and some of you are off camera, and so if you have access to the ability to raise the blue hand on any of the questions that get, that get asked by the council, please do let us know if you want to answer. If nobody is speaking and you just want to come off mute and say, hey, uh, and somebody else might be ready, I'll, I'll cue you up. Uh, because you may have multiple perspectives on similar questions. And so one of my questions for you now is, uh, what are the steps that you believe can be taken right now? One of the things that I think is so powerful is that we haven't reached the point where these guidelines have to be enforced. We are actually in a position where we can prevent a harm. We can be proactive, not reactionary. And so what are the steps that you would like to see uh, both elected officials, hospitals be taking right now to kind of correct the problems that we see as an immediate issue before we're making these difficult decisions we do have an opportunity right now to save lives and i'm just going to kick that to the group uh anybody who uh, would like to answer that please do uh raise your hand or, or let me know if you're on video you can raise a hand and then when i see you i'll answer on you if you want to use the blue button you can do that um but what are things concrete steps that you believe we can take is did i see a dr kadir did you have your hand up i can tell uh dr martin okay there we go I can, I can certainly start us off and then maybe have some other folks hop in. There are three things that I think are critical sort of next steps to prevent us from hitting this crisis standard of care uh, threshold, which thankfully we haven't hit yet. Um, the first is around mass testing. Um, and that is um, the idea that we need to figure out who is sick and who is not sick. And then from there, take next steps to better protect our communities. We've done this the exact opposite way. We've, we've applied this health equity lens at the end of this process. In reality, this must start with health equity. These sorts of decisions have to start through the lens of how do we take care of the folks who have been most impacted by social determinants of health. And so doing targeted and intentional mass testing in some of our uh, poorest and most low, low, low resource communities is incredibly important. At Mass General, we're starting to do some of that work. Um, and hopefully we will be able to catch up. The second is around uh, providing uh, sort of concrete resources for patients to do the things that we tell them to do. I'll tell you a quick story. I took care of a patient two or three weeks ago who was a young woman in her early 30s who was uh, a mother of three and had uh, her elderly mother living with her in a one bedroom in Dorchester. And after we got our COVID res uh, results back, you know, she had COVID-19 and was symptomatic. And I told her, you know, you have to go home and self-isolate. She looked at me, she said, doctor, how do I self-isolate? I live with my three kids and I live with my, my mother who's in her 60s. And so um, I didn't have a response for her. Our public health system does need a response. We need to figure out what it could look like to maybe take patients who live in cramped quarters like that and, and, and admit them to uh, you know, uh, other sorts of intermediary types of housing or ways to uh, make it easier for people to self-isolate uh, and quarantine at home. Um, and the third is just around um, equal access to any vaccines or treatments that, that can, uh, that, that might come out of this uh, process of development discovery that we're in right now. You know, we already saw um, who the winners and losers were with regard to who got access to COVID-19 tests. Um, and so, for example, the first couple of weeks that we had testing available, we only had 20 tests for our entire hospital and our hospital is not any different than every, any other hospital across this country. And so we ended up in scenarios where patients were thinking that they would be able to get tested um, because they looked on their social media feed and on Twitter and on the news and saw that the entire Brooklyn Nets was tested. But then they come to our hospital and they've got symptoms, they probably have COVID and we tell them, I'm sorry, we, we can't give you a test. So if and when we get to the point where a vaccine is developed or treatments are developed, we need to be careful and make sure that we are able to provide those vaccines and treatments in an equitable fashion. Thank you for that. Uh, if anybody else wanted to take a stab at the question of, of ways we can practice uh, and do work right now to get ahead and be proactive rather than reactionary too. Uh, some of these racial equity issues. Um, and I'll just say one thing, uh, because I know it was mentioned earlier, uh, the ICU bed uh, situation that we have in Boston is very different than the ones around the region. 
I know that Worcester, uh, I believe, is at about 90% right now as we speak. Uh, and one of the things that, that I've made very clear, and, and I'm sure some of you may also know better than me because you practice in these hospitals, is that we have some of the best hospitals in the country. Eventually, that over uh, that overflow will come here, and so our numbers could go up very quickly uh, in Boston in terms of who's utilizing these ICUs. And so I think it's very important to understand that it's not only a question about guidelines for right this second, but also the CDC has said that we might be facing this outbreak worse than we are right now in the fall. And so these are issues that we want to really get in front of. Um, and so just a second question and my final question for this. Oh, uh, I see uh, Dr. Kadir. Yeah. I wanted to add one, one point um, to what Alistair was saying and um, to your question about uh, whether right now we're not at a point where we need to invoke some of these crisis standards of care. I do want to emphasize that this is the first time that our society has been this close to needing to invoke um, these standards on a you know, population level that would affect um, a tremendous, like entirely, essentially our entire um, nation's population. And so uh, there's a reason why states are now um, moving to try to publish these guidelines as quickly as possible. And um, I want to emphasize that, you know, for, for the physicians here, we all understand that these guidelines and essentially all of the um, the recommendations that are published in our medical journals are like the dogma and essentially they become um, set in stone uh, once they are published until unless you quickly and fiercely advocate and make changes immediately. And so I think the the, the point of trying to um, push for change as forcefully as possible at this moment is try to um, essentially change the narrative and change the, the standards that are going to be applied for decades to come um, in, the, in the anticipating the next pandemic, the next disaster, the next public health emergency that we're going to face. And so it's not just about this moment. It's about you know, this pandemic. It's about, uh, again, as Alistair was saying, pushing this conversation forward. Every time we hear about a, a public health emergency, we read about how uh, people of color were disproportionately affected. It's all retrospective. It happens every time. And this is our opportunity to start prospectively making changes so that this does not keep happening. Pandemic after pandemic, public emergency after public health emergency. Thank you so much. Uh, I agree with that. I have one question so that I can take it to my colleagues and give them time and then we'll do it in rounds. Um, but my second question to that point is I've stated repeatedly that I don't, I'm not interested in the autopsy of what happens in three, four months about all the ways in which we've let our communities down. I'm much more interested in proactively being in front of these issues. And so with that in mind, as we deal with uh, testing shortages, as we deal with a shortage in PPE, as we deal with a shortage in where things go and who gets uh, the services they need, can any of you speak to either issues or areas of concern that you've seen on the floor or in the work that you're doing right now that you would like highlighted and, and sort of addressed uh, in a public fashion uh, or alternatively to that, uh, ways in which we can really start pushing for equity and other factors that deal with our health in this crisis right now in terms of who's receiving care and how they're receiving their care. And then I'll, I'll go to Councillor Campbell, if, if anybody would like to answer that. I see, yeah, one second. Thank you. And please just introduce yourself for the one second. If we can unmute. There you go. Uh, if you could just introduce yourself again to the folks on the phone who don't have video. Again, my name is Onyechi A.K. I'm an ER a physician. I think one of the other things that we have been discussing as a group is also how do we provide for patients outside of the hospital? I think Dr. Uh, Martin mentioned this, but we also have to consider that we are discharging these patients to homes where they're not able to self-isolate, to food deserts, to places where they do not have the opportunity to use their own personal transportation when they do have to go to work, to so areas where they may not be able to have their medications delivered. So I think we also have to emphasize the role that community health care workers and the community itself is really going to help with this pan pandemic. We have to figure out, yes, all the PPE, all the ventilators, all the medications for all the patients in the hospital, but a good portion of patients are also getting discharged home. The last thing that we need is for patients who have been discharged to come back to the 
the hospital because somehow they didn't get their, their medications or their nutrition was inadequate or they were re-exposed to the virus. So I think also some discussion and some work has to be done on that level. Thank you so much. And uh, with that, I'll save my questions for the second round. Um, I'm gonna go to uh, Councillor Campbell who will be followed by Councillor Jing. Thank you, Councillor Arroyo, and thank you to the panelists um, for not only the work you're doing in your respective fields, um, but for your fierce advocacy, right? Many of you could just continue the work and say, you know, someone else can advocate for these guidelines to change. Um, but I appreciate the intentionality um, that each of you have offered, not only in this conversation, um, but at the state level, in any space where it's important that you raise up your voice to talk about the importance of equity. Um, I, I also wanted to sort of thank you on behalf of my constituents. Um, I have a district, predominantly district of color. This is Dorchester and Mattapan. Mattapan from Lower Mills going all the way up to Grove Hall. And let me tell you, these calls that I am taking and fielding are extremely painful. Um, you know, where people are dying, right? So uh, if it's not hearing from folks who have lost a loved one to COVID-19, who have had testing done, to, you know, one or two times and the barriers and how hard it is to get tested, those folks who are at home um, after a call with their doctor, self-quarantining and not knowing how to do that, still having questions around what does that mean? Um, I, I just appreciate the breadth of your advocacy and, and, and I know that um, to be able to just report back to my people that there are folks on the front lines in the healthcare system advocating on their behalf is extremely important to them. So thank you. Um, I also just wanted to uh, raise up what Council Royal said about other municipalities that we're paying attention to, which of course, what's happening in Boston doesn't, uh, isn't separate and apart from what's happening in Worcester or Springfield or other municipalities as well. My, I guess, my one question, and I want to be mindful of the time. I know you guys have obviously jobs um, and, and work to do, but is what is the what are you finding to be the barriers, um, the pushback from the state level um, with respect to you trying to get them to open their eyes to what we already in this group agree upon? Right, we get it, we see it. Um, I think Council Roy and I can speak to the pushback. Um, the politics, the political layers of all of this. Um, but I'm curious from your perspective, what some of that, the barriers are currently, even post the revised guidelines, which people are pushing out as a win and that you know now they're expecting us just to move on. You know, what are some of the barriers and pushback in sort of concrete terms that you're hearing, particularly from folks in power, those in the political space? Um, because I think we are more than willing to, to sort of take this on with such a sense of urgency that you guys are, because we know our constituents are dying and will continue to die as a result of, of, of COVID-19. And I might have Council Royal sort Sorry, of- Sorry, yeah, if I can just see, if I can yeah, see I can. on that question. Oh, I, I see one now, uh, one second. Thank you for using the blue, it's very helpful. Your, uh, Dr. Jane, oh, you just mute. There you go. Now you're on mute. Sorry. Yeah. You're um, one thing that I think would be helpful is better data collection at the state level. I think that is still potentially lacking. When we look at our, we've started to collect data on a hospital level about the demographics of our patients, but at the state level, we're finding that up to a third to 40% of the numbers have, for example, other or unspecified uh, for race and ethnicity, which does make it more challenging to really pin down um, some of the demographics of this and really target our interventions. Uh, I think also at a state level, it's important to make sure that the messaging going out to communities is language concordant and culturally sensitive, given that we, as you've mentioned, lived in such diverse communities. Um, and that these really cultural factors and the realities that people live with for many do have to still go to work to support themselves. It's impossible to stay home or to self-isolate. Um, so I think coordinating those efforts on a state level would be immensely helpful and getting that data, that clarity of data will really help guide the response uh, moving forward. And I'm just curious, what else are people hearing in response to 
you know, we've been talking at the local level in Boston, I think for some time around the importance of testing. Um, and, and Dr. Martin, I think spoke to this as others as well, um, that targeted testing, particularly in certain neighborhoods, certain populations of people. And the response is, well, the federal government has to change guidelines or the state, the state. And it's like, okay, well, at what point does, do we sort of mobilize as a collective to say, that's unacceptable. Like what is within our power to change now and what isn't, well, we'll work on those pieces. And so I, I find myself often confused um, as to what we can do, what we can't do, and what the state can do, what the federal government can't. So I'm curious to hear what, what are some of the other, the other sort of pushback and barriers you're hearing, not just around guidelines, around testing, targeted testing, as to why this just isn't happening. Any, anybody on that one? Well, yeah, I see a few folks. You're you're unmuted, so you can just go. And actually, just for the sake of, because it's on video and it's harder, if you just unmute yourself and go, I'll understand. <laughs> just make sure you introduce yourself. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, again, I'm Wendy Macias Constantopoulos. I, I don't know if this is necessarily a pushback, um, but as opposed to a true and true barrier. But I know that um, you know nationally and locally, uh, we are constantly um, hitting up against uh, shortages. Um, so shortages of testing, uh, viral media, lab capacity. Uh, these are sort of real challenges that have to be overcome. And so I'm not necessarily saying that that is a, um, a pushback, but it certainly impedes the ability to move forward in a more um, sort of broad sweeping way that, you know, that many people have called for. Um, that being said, I know that uh, it's sort of a daily, on a daily basis, there are efforts that are ongoing to try to improve our supply chains. Um, to make sure that we have enough testing to stand up um, labs that are able to process these tests um, in a timely fashion. And there have been efforts, as I believe was already mentioned um, by Dr. Martin, to go out into the community and reach into the people by using and uh, leveraging some of the resources in those communities. Um, you know, this is, it's great that we're doing this, but in, if we could do it all over again, this is something that needs to happen from the very beginning. So at the very start of when we start to hear that this is becoming a pandemic, um, we know where those numbers are going to come from. We know who are going to be the hardest hit people, communities, um, neighborhoods. So we have to be able to go in there and immediately start to implement preventative strategies that will prevent um, you know, the numbers from escalating out of control. Um, some of that is the fact that we, it's not so much that at the local level we were unprepared, it was sort of more of a broader situation as we all know. Um, nationally, it's been very difficult to get prepared because of the limitations and the sequestration of um, shipments. Um, so, so that has certainly um, impeded some of our capacity and ability to to get ahead of this uh, fast enough. And then the only the only other thing I will add is that um, one very sort of real operational um, challenge is how to how to coordinate in real time across multiple hospitals across the entire Commonwealth to ensure that we have. Um, real-time data of where these ICU beds are and where the vents are located. And then we have to think about, you know, the, the difficulties that maybe a respiratory technician who has trained with two or three different brands of ventilators might have if they are then provided a ventilator that they've never worked with before. So, you know, just trying to think about on the ground, real um, challenges and situations uh, that um, perhaps are not pushback, but that are realities that have to be uh, addressed. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jane, I think, would like to answer that question as well. All right, just one other quick thing I would add is I think in terms of the, the massive testing question, one barrier that I've heard and noticed from patients and providers taking care of patients um, is that there needs to be transparency and openness around people feeling safe to get tested 
um, both from an immigration perspective as well as from a perspective of access to benefits and cost. Um, and I think that kind of messaging from a top-down level is really, really important um, because those barriers are very real for many of our patients, or I'm sure many of your constituents too, which prevent them from potentially um, utilizing the services that are starting to be uh, increased in capacity. I uh, see one more hand. Just to add a point, along with uh, with uh, testing, I think there's also going to be an amount of, of education that we have to give to the public too. The test is only about 70% sensitive. So there will be points, if, if, even if we do massive testing where there will be false negatives. And I think in that case, we just have to educate the public like that even though your test is negative, you are in an area that is high risk, these are the precautions that you still have to take. And just educating the public and make sure that they fully understand that is also one of the things that has to be done. Thanks, Thank you. I appreciate you raising that because I came up on a call just with a constituent today who tested negative and then went back and I think tested positive. And so we've heard that quite a bit in certain neighborhoods and why you still need to be taking care of yourself and following the precautions. So I appreciate you raising that. Thank you, Councilor Royo. Um, I want to be respectful of our colleagues. Thank you. And so, uh, and there will be a second round as long as folks are able to stay around. Uh, so it's Councilor Janie or, or President Janie rather, uh, Councilor uh, Braden followed by Councilor Bach, followed by Councilor Mejia. Uh, sorry, uh, followed by, let me just give you the first one and then I'll set it up for the rest of them. But it's Councilor Janie followed by Councilor Braden. Thank you. The floor is yours, President Janie. Uh, thank you so much. And I, um, again, want to say thank you to the panel, um, not just for being here um, for this very thoughtful uh, discussion, but also for the work that you do every day. And certainly to the, the makers, of this hearing order, Councilor Arroyo and Councilor Campbell. Uh, the two of them, plus myself, we represent Roxbury, uh, Dorchester, and Mattapan. So certainly uh, areas within our city uh, that are known to have uh, health disparities, um, certainly areas within our city where um, people of color live and oftentimes are living in poor communities. So uh, this uh, hits home for me, for sure. Um, my district alone, looking at District 7, you know, there's a 30-year a, a difference in the life expectancy between uh, white people and black people in my district, depending on uh, where you live in my district. Um, and so these issues, again, hit home. Um, I'm interested in understanding from your perspective, um, really uh, talking to the panel here, um, what would be helpful in terms of next steps to, to move this um, forward. Again, very grateful and, and prayerful uh, that we don't get into a situation where we have uh, more patients than we have actual uh, supplies for. I never want to be in that situation, but in terms of just supporting your overall work, um, whether it's on this specific issue and how we move uh, that conversation forward as a next step or how we can just support your day-to-day -day work as you uh, work so hard on the front lines of this crisis. Um, so if you could just let, let us know how the council can be supportive on those two fronts, that will be it for me. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I see a couple of hands out. Uh, uh, if you could just go and then. Um, so I think one of the major ways uh, you know, that we can prevent getting to the point where invoking crisis standards of care would be necessary. You know, there's, it's a tight coupling between education of the public and, um, and the medical care that is needed. Um, so efforts that are within the community uh, that are perhaps even led by community leaders, community health workers that are trusted um, are really, I think, um, important to roll out quickly in these situations, providing the education, um, connecting, uh, connecting folks to resources that they might need so, so that they can have access to all their needs, um, making sure that those who are essential workers are able to get to and from work in a safe manner, making sure that specifically those essential workers who have to commute 
on a daily basis, have access to masks, even when masks they may not be accessible, you know, to 100% of of the of the community. Um, I think those efforts that are born within the community uh, can be really helpful to decrease the transmission and thereby decrease the chances that we will reach this threshold where crisis standards of care are required. Thank you. Anyone else would like to tackle that question or add anything to that question? Uh, and if you're on, uh, the phone, just unmute and, and jump in uh, because I can't actually see if you raise your hand or anything like that. Okay. Uh, any other questions, Councillor Janey? No, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, with that, it's actually Councillor Braden followed by Councillor Asadi George. So, Councillor Braden, if you have any questions. Councillor Asadi George, if you have any questions. I do. Thank you for uh, thank you everybody too for sticking it out. I know this is a long hearing, but it's um, certainly very informative. And I think along the lines of Councilor Janey's question, what is it that the City Council can do? Because I think we're all looking for action steps, and this has certainly been um, very informative um, and certainly um, creates for me personally a deeper thinking about this situation and, and the crisis that we find ourselves in. So two questions for you. Um, and again, I appreciate all of your time here today. What can we do uh, in particular as a city council? And then this crisis standards of care, I didn't know about this prior to this uh, COVID crisis. I, I'm just learning so much about it. When do we decide, um, what's that trigger point that we create a standard of care um, and when this is written, how do we make sure that the right people are at the table um, when we're determining this? So those are my two questions. I think they've they've sort of been loosely responded to through your presentations, but I'd love to know what we can do and what determines um, when these standards of care, when the standard is written and when does that trigger get, you know, the, the, the switch get flipped in order to put it into place. But thank you all for being here. Thank you for that question. Uh, anybody want to answer that? Do we have anybody who would like to answer that question? You can just unmute if you, if so, or if you'd like clarification on the question. I believe the question was, what, at what point do institutions create a crisis standard of care? I think um, most in, most institutions, most at least hospital institutions, part of their emergency preparedness is to have a crisis standard of care. It's the same thing when when they do incident a command. You know, we use the crisis standard of care when demand exceeds resources, and as institutions, as hospitals, that should always be part of the plan. So, in terms of at what point do they uh, create it? It's I think it is there. But it, the, the question is, at what point do they revise it and at what point do they actually implement it is going to depend on the resources that are available at that uh, moment. So we just recently wrote this standard of care in response to COVID or is that something that's already existed? I'm a high school teacher. I, I'm not, not involved in the medical field. I can answer that question. So um, I think the, the concept of crisis standards of care actually originated um, after the H1N1 influenza um, kind of mini pandemic. Um, and one of our institutions are of, um, that we kind of, uh, that we kind of re uh, regard as uh, kind of the, one of the gospels of our medical field is called the Institute of Medicine, now called the uh, National Academy of Science. Uh, they released um, a document that specifically addressed um, the concept of needing to ration, essentially, um, if our healthcare system were to be overwhelmed and we would not have we would not have enough resources for everyone, and so they they termed this shift from what we would consider our normal standards of care, where we would do everything for everyone, to a crisis standard of care, and um, it's rooted in, in bioethical principles. And so I think the key here is that. Um, 
a lot of these theories that are applied to crisis centers care, uh, concepts of utilitarianism, you know, trying to help the most number of people, concepts of justice, which is, you know, something that we all are very passionate about. Um, they uh, they went into um, forming kind of the structure for coming up with these crisis centers of care. But again, um, we haven't really come close to having to use it um, until this point. And so it's time to take these theories and um, and make them practical and make them up to date and reflective of our uh, values um, and reflective of the, um, the disparities that are uh, within our uh, communities of color. And who determines who's at the table to write them or to create these prescriptions? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> and I don't know uh, if there's a, an, a, an answer that I, at least I am uh, aware of. It seems like a, a lot of the um, processes of responding to public health emergencies are, you know, led like by the DPH, by some um, disaster medicine folks. And then um, there are a lot of stakeholders that are involved in making um, these decisions, like ICU doctors. Um, and But I'm not sure how they select who is on the committee that ultimately determines the guidelines. It's, I think it's variable uh, institution to institution and state to state. I can actually speak just a little bit to this question. Um, we were speaking with uh, members of the Optimum Care Committee at my institution, Mass General, last night um, about this specific question. And um, almost all the folks, to my understanding, that are on the Crisis Standards of Care Committee are medical professionals. I think the majority are doctors. There's also some nurses. When we inquired about having non-medical folks on the on the committee, um, it was brought up that often it's very helpful to have folks who are who have a medical background because often it requires going into patient health records such as Epic and being able to navigate and some of that stuff is is, is very tricky to do if you don't have that kind of experience. So that was something that we heard from the folks who are on the committee um, as you know as kind of a response to our question about why there are not. Um, any medical, um, non-medical folks on that committee. Thank you, Dr. Phil. Oh, I think that being said, it's kind of important or essential to have diversity of voices and experiences when creating these committees. They are often very homogeneous and do not reflect the populations with, in which they look like or work for. So I think that's really essential. Yeah, and I will echo that because, you know, this uh, movement of health equity is really something that has been born in our communities uh, and the communities that we represent. Um, and if you don't have that representation on these committees, then it's easy to have blind spots that you are so embedded in thinking about crisis standards of care from perhaps a disaster perspective or perhaps a, you know, a very sort of academic ethics uh, perspective. Um, and so you fail to recognize how, you know, having a sentence that says that, you know, race and ethnicity will not be taken into account, how that doesn't really cover the problem. Um, and so I, I, I'm going to echo that that's where um, it really needs to be, um, there needs to be a change. To your question about what the city council can do, I think um, certain institutions have more capacity to really think about these crisis standards of care and have these large committees within a hospital and um, potentially having some guidance from the state level that's much more explicit about the need for diversity on these committees will be very useful for the many hospitals across the state. Um, that may not have the capacity to be thinking as deeply about this in the moment. Um, and so I think as a city council, one thing that would be would be so helpful is if you can also advocate up to the state level and within the city um, to make sure that the committees at the um, state level and at the Department of Public Health that are establishing these crisis standards of care are diverse, are reflective of the communities um, because that will ultimately trickle down and influence the policies that hospitals are putting into place as well. Um, I think also just to add to um, and echo my colleagues' points, I think it's important to also keep in mind that community health workers and community um, advocacy groups 
have been doing this work outside the context of a you know the, this particular crisis and have been doing it for quite a long time and know what the everyday barriers are to health for the communities that they work with and those are the kind um, not having that kind of participation is what creates the kind of blind spots um, that were mentioned by my colleague and so I think that that recognizing um, the the importance and the knowledge that those groups bring to this process is, is really really critical. Thank you, everybody, for that. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Arroyo. And I will, I, I think it's Dr. Uh, is it Iki that uh, was a, at least a practitioner for a short period of time at the Dorchester House Health Center? No? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, I think community health centers is where it's at. And uh, it's, a, it's a, certainly a a way to truly understand the needs of our communities across the city. Uh, thank you again, Chairman Arroyo. Thank you. Uh, and so it's if Councillor Bach is there, followed by uh, <laughs> Councillor Mejia. So there is Councillor Bach, if you have any questions. And just uh, so everybody knows, uh, we'll, we'll do a quick second round. If anybody wants to use that to give a closing and or ask a question, then fine. So Councillor Bach, the floor is yours. Floor is yours. Great, thank you all so much. Um, I, I'm listening to this whole hearing. I, sorry, I wasn't able to ask questions earlier. Um, I, I wanna thank you for your advocacy. I think that the, although we haven't gotten where we need to be yet, you've seen that your voices and voices like yours have really made a difference. I mean, even in the changes that have already come through. Um, and I really appreciate um, what one of you just said about the fact that uh, that these are things where if you don't challenge them right when they get issued, they kind of get into the water and, and then it's very hard to roll them back. Um, so really appreciate the work on that, um, even though I'm frustrated that, uh, frustrated in some ways that all of you here, um, you know, wearing white coats have to be spending time in the middle of a crisis on, an, on this issue. Um, and I think one of the things you've really lifted up is how, how important it is in ordinary time for us to be thinking about who's sitting around the table so that we're not holding hearings like this in extraordinary times. Um, I think uh, most, of, most of my questions have been answered. Um, I, I, I guess I would be interested to know, um, it strikes me as someone who's not, um, not somebody with a medical background, but somebody who thinks a lot. I did a PhD in the history of ethics. Um, and I think one of the challenges um, that I've always struggled with vis-a-vis -vis medical ethics is kind of the natural tilt into utilitarianism as soon as you start talking about systems, just because it's like the easiest way to make things numerical and kind of add up um, pluses and minuses and sort of say, hey, we got the, the greatest good for the greatest number. Um, isn't necessarily night, not like right, it's just highly quantifiable. Um, and I wonder, I wonder whether, and, and to me, it's often been a limitation on us um, helping our most vulnerable populations. And I think about the fact that even with the connection between housing and health that we've started to see more and more, in some ways, what really got the ball rolling on that was the recognition that our unhoused folks were costing the medical system so much money. So it sort of, it became in certain ways about the dollars and cents. And then I think we started to see some of the, um, some of the real reasons for doing it. But I guess my question for you is, um, do you think there are any non crisis of care spaces in the medical space where you see a kind of different and more full justice perspective on medicine and actually like taking hold and pushing back on um, some of the kind of easy slide into utilitarianism. And are there any resources there for a um, whole community to learn from when they think about things like the crisis of care? Like, are there any spaces where you see um, that sort of greater depth of uh, values um, being effectively to practice in, in hospital or community health center um, decision making. I'm not entirely sure that this will answer your question. Um, 
but I'll just throw it out there. Uh, there, there are efforts um, across the U.S. to move towards value-based care, and much of value-based care is uh, looking to improve the health and well-being of those who are probably the most complex patients and whose social needs uh, tend to be um, so profound that it in, they interfere with health and their ability to maintain their health. Um, and so I guess in non-crisis times, uh, there might be some lessons to be learned about that way of thinking, um, that you have to put extra resources and extra effort into helping those communities and those individuals who um, are just on a different um, you know, different playing field. Um, they're, they definitely require more um, resources and, and effort. Um, and if we are going to maintain health and, uh, and help them to access care, to uh, adhere to um, medical treatments, to make sure that they have a refrigerator where they can put their insulin, you know, whatever it may be, um, that might be an example of some of the work that is done in non-crisis times. I think I can also maybe speak to an example that again may not answer directly or um, be a perfect example of, um, of balancing justice with this utilitarian concept. Um, it back in, and this is like a global health example, um, when the HIV ep epidemic was um, having an effect in uh, the African continent. Um, I think initial guidance from the WHO said that um, an ART, antiretroviral therapy, was um, being given to um, to American citizens and uh, citizens of Western countries. Uh, the WHO initially released guidance that they actually did not recommend that um, that we give uh, antiretroviral therapy to people in Africa, essentially, because there was this assumption made that there would be lack of adherence, and then that would make the medication less effective. And so it almost is kind of a similar concept in that they, um, there was an assumption made that in order to help the greater society and make these medications more effective, that we would deny um, a certain group of people uh, this medication. And it was through uh, local um, uh, community groups and actually, I think researchers um, are uh, who proved that the assumption was incorrect and that um, well, Africa would actually have even better uh, adherence and um, to these medications. And so now it's you know universally available on, on the on the African continent. So that's kind of a good example. Yeah. No, I think that's that's really helpful. And it, it just seems to me that. Um, yeah, a, a policy a policy judgment like that involves like you know just thinking of uh, of people as interchangeable, and I think the work of uh, you know in a lot of ways um, the work of anti racism in our society is really giving everybody dignity in a way that doesn't make them interchangeable. Um, and it yeah, it's just I, as somebody I represent the district that most of the hospitals in the city are in. Um, and District 8, which runs all the way from the West End, where MGH is, um, all the way through Beacon Hill, Back Bay, the whole Longwood area, out to Mission Hill. Um, and just thinking about the difference in life expectancy from one end of my district to the other um, is, is astonishing. And I think it's really important to me that the, that the care that's being offered there it like really sees all the people of Boston. Um, and uh, and so I just, I, again, just wanna really say, I appreciate all the work that you guys are doing, everything we can do to support it, um, we will. And uh, thanks again for taking the time to be here today. I'm all set, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you, Councilor Bach. And uh, Councilor Mejia, you now have the floor. Uh, it's yours. Thank you. Um, so I, first, I just wanna say thank you to all the doctors that have stayed on this long. And I also wanna just express my sincere disappointment in the fact that we're having a conversation with people who deeply care about our people and that no one here um, 
aside, you know, there's no one, the, the, the doctor who was here earlier had to leave, you know, some folks from the administration are not here. And, and it's really sad um, that this is, this is the conversation that we're having. And those, when we talk about speaking truth to power and that the people in positions of power are not here to hear us directly, makes me feel some kind of way. But um, as Councillor Arroyo mentioned that um, this will be televised and the revolution will still happen whether or not they wanna hear it. So um, I, I think that it's really important for us to, to continue um, having these conversations. But I've gotten to a point um, where I wanna move beyond the dialogue. Uh, earlier, I asked the question specifically about who was at the table in terms of even designing um, this the system of care. I, I, I find even that language of care to be even misleading because if it's really about care or standards of care or whatever the case is, I feel like there are people are not feeling as though we're being cared for. Um, and so I, I think it's really important um, when I think about language is how we're utilizing language these days um, because it could be misleading. And I also think that in terms of like the folks who um, should be at the table, uh, in addition to all of you fabulous folks, I would also like to advocate that we have folks who are not um, in the industry, like everyday people, um, single moms, you know, young people, uh, low wage workers, immigrants, people who are undocumented. I believe all of those voices need to be at the table informing what this looks like because we all have a very different lived experience and we all interpret things um, through our own little lived experience and our lens, right? So I think that cultural competency is really important um, as we continue to move forward with this conversation is recognizing that um, and I, I don't know who, which one of you all talked about the race and the tokenism situation. I know everybody wants to check off the box, but there's so many other boxes and so many other layers that often get left out of these conversations that I really want to make sure that in this, as we continue to move forward, that we're thinking about the, the different types of voices that should help inform this thinking. And I want to uplift those um, through my own lived experience and the constituents that I serve. And I will also say, um, and I'm giving you my closing remarks because I have to go to another Zoom, y'all. So I'm giving it to you all right now. Um, that I also just want to want to say is that um, in, in terms of what the city council can do, I go back to this whole notion of political will. Um, we have, ha we have a mandate from, for the, from the people who put us in office that we're gonna represent them and we're gonna fight for their best interest. And that includes making sure that we're holding all systems accountable, including institutions. And so if there are, there are hospitals in the city of Boston who are doing business in the city of Boston, at the very least, we need to figure out how we can hold those institutions accountable to changing their language and being more inclusive. And whatever it takes for us on the council to move that work forward, I'm all about. Um, and so I, I don't have a question because everyone already asked you all what we can do, but if there's anything that I can do specifically with the fire that I bring to this, and if there's anything that you want me to share with the folks that we serve in terms of messaging, um, now is the time. And this is the last thing that I'll say is that we can't talk about flattening the curve because our people don't even understand what that means. We can't talk about social distancing because that also is mis misleading. I would also encourage you all to tell your colleagues when you're interacting with folks in, in, in those places is that we need to be really mindful of what we're communicating to people. And when we send people home because we can't test them, then we need to be able to send them home with some guidance on how they can treat. Um, I know there's no cure for it, but at the very least, I've heard of people taking thero Theraflu or some other, other things that people can do so they just don't go home and die. And I feel like sometimes people don't go to the hospital because they don't trust the hospital, but then they go to the hospital and they told just to go home and ride this out. And I think that I'd love to hear, actually I do, I do have a question. I'd love to hear from you all, what can we say to our people um, aside from just going home and writing this out. Thank you so much. Raising hands. Um, I, I, I just wanted to comment on something you said that I thought was so important. Um, and 
that is that, um, you know, there is kind of a model of healthcare and healing that talks, it's called healing centered engagement, um, which was brought up by Sean Ginwright. And healing centered engagement is approaching um, health from the standpoint that the trauma, um, for the trauma of racism, the trauma of economic injustice um, that creates bad health um, are collective experiences. And so people need to have collective healing. And this collective healing happens through political engagement, since political um, problems are actually what create poor health and create disparity in health care. So I think that that model of care um, is something that um, some physicians are really trying to bring into um, how we take care of patients, how um, hospital systems think about taking care of patients, um, how we engage with communities, and how we think about communities as asset-driven, um, and not um, that this is happening to people, but that we have the the, the skills and the knowledge and the history um, and the deep organizing um, within ourselves to actually solve the problem of health within our communities. So I just, I hope that in some way answers your question a little bit and also the question before about just models. I think that's really important. Um, yes, thank you for your comments. I want to just to lift up even the work that Dr. Uh, Messias is doing at MGH in terms of the language that you were speaking about. She's definitely led efforts where when we're having difficult conversations with, with, uh, with uh, patients that there's actually going to be someone there who speaks their language, especially for Spanish uh, speaking uh, patients. And we've, she's um, had a system where there's like placards that, that the physicians can actually place by the bedside and then ask. So I think those efforts are actually being implemented and those concerns are being, being heard. So I want you to know that people are actively uh, working on those efforts. One other thing that we're working on in, in the Department of Emergency Medicine and, and we've created partnerships with um, uh, the Department of Internal Medicine, some of the folks are on this call, is um, a mechanism to try to um, reach out and, uh, and check in on patients who we send home because there is a lot of anxiety um, that people feel in going home and most people do okay with this illness, but um, we are making a lot of assumptions about people's understanding of what they need to do when they go home. We're making a lot of assumptions about what resources they have access to, their ability to self-isolate. And so um, we've really started to try to figure out how we can support people um, once they leave the emergency department and um, doing things like doing a very detailed um, health-related social needs survey um, to try to connect them with resources um, and then checking in uh, in a couple of days See how their symptoms have progressed um, and trying to you know, see if they need to be instructed to come back to the emergency department and encourage them to do that if they um, um, if they do have worsening symptoms and we're actually one of our um, colleagues in the department of uh, emergency medicine has created this paramedicine uh, program where uh, they will check in um, on patients at home can check their oxygen levels can give them IV fluids um, and so uh, people are starting to think about um, ways that we can we can do better and um, we can kind of affect some of these social factors that actually have probably the most impact on how people do with this with this illness because it's it's not biologic why you know people of color and people who are marginalized are dying at higher rates because of these social factors that have already led them to be unhealthy that prevent them from getting you know, taking care of themselves, being able to take care of themselves in a way that, um, that you know, makes their immune system robust enough to be able to fight this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Ricardo. Yes. Uh, Arroyo, I know you're facilitating, um, but I wanted to, one more thing I just wanted to say is that I sound very passionate, so I wasn't yelling at any of y'all because you all, <laughs> you all my people and you all get it. So I, that was more, you know, that's just me being expressive. So I just want to really be mindful of my tone. I don't want to scare anyone. Um, and then the other, the other thing that I just um, wanted to uplift is that I think what we can do as a council when you guys get ready for this sort of type of um, next steps is 
I, I'd love to be able to help identify if we want to create like some sort of task force where there is a standard of, of like review process that it goes through not just folks who understand the world, but people who may not understand it um, and can help inform it. So I think that that's something concretely that we can walk out of this conversation with in terms of exploring how we make sure that we have access, um, that we create opportunities for people to be in this space as well. So I just want to say thank you again for all of your work um, and for, for, for being here and Councillor Arroyo for facilitating this very important dialogue and to um, Councillor Campbell for bringing this to our attention and my colleagues. Um, so thank you again. I'm going to another Zoom, but I love y'all. I'm gonna see y'all later. I gotta go. Thank you so much. Uh, and so we're gonna start a second round. I really only have two brief questions. One that I always wanted when I was on panels like this, uh, but one to just refocus. Uh, the state guidelines as they are currently written, and this is something that I, I'm gonna speak to my own opinion on this, and then I just kinda wanna get the panels uh, that are still here. And I think it came through loud and clear, but I wanna make sure it's clear. The original, uh, state guidelines and crisis of care were racist. They had incredible racial inequity built into them, uh, and the outcomes would have been racist and inequitable. The revision that happened 48, hour ago, 48 hours ago has not completely cured that problem. And I just want to be, for me, and I just want to be clear with the doctors that we do have here, whether or not anybody here believes, and you can just say yes, if it's so, that the current crisis of care standards as currently written with the revision from 48 hours ago uh, is actually one that doesn't further racial inequity. Does anybody here believe that those crisis of care standards as revised no longer further racial inequity? And going once, going twice, got it. All right, so that's one. So anybody who's listening or, or paying attention to this was holding up this revision as somehow curing these state guidelines of racial inequity. Uh, I haven't heard from a single panelist here, uh, including uh, who we had here for uh, Dr. Weinstein for Stewart, that they believe that these new guidelines actually were implementable without creating some kind of racial uh, disparity for Stewart. He never said that specifically. What he said is they're not using them, they're using short-term morbid morbidity. And so uh, I just wanna make that clear in terms of just this hearing that there's work to be done there, that the revisions aren't uh, or should not be complete. Uh, and then two, here's my question for all of you individually. Is there a question that wasn't asked of you today that you wanted asked or that you would like to answer? And then what is your answer to that question? And that's for everybody. It could be that you don't have that. It could be that you do. Does anybody have an answer or a question that they wish they were asked that they were not uh, and they would like to answer? You can take a second on that. I'll give you a second. Going once, going twice. Okay, so I'm, that's glad, I'm glad. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm glad that all of the questions and all of the information that you wanted to provide, you were able to do so today. Um, again, you're all heroes in the work that you're doing both in and out of hospitals. Um, this is uh, deeply, deeply moving for me to have so many uh, doctors of color here speaking directly to issues uh, that really reflect uh, deep-seated generational inequities in our communities. Uh, the way you fight for your patients in and out of hospitals is moving to me um, and, and a great example to others. And so thank you so much. Uh, with that, I'm gonna just ask other counselors that are on here whether or not they would like to make any closing statement. Uh, I'll, I'll start with Counselor Campbell, but if uh, Counselor Bach or Counselor Janey or Counselor Braden, if your camera goes on, I'll know that you also would like to make a closing statement. So Counselor Campbell. Uh, thank you, Council Royal, and um, from Aiden, my four-month-old, to you, uh, doctors, thank you so much for staying on. Thank you for participating in this conversation, for the work you do every day. Um, I will follow up with Council Royal in terms of um, next steps because there is some continued advocacy we can do in this space around the guidelines, the new guidelines that people think have solved the problem, around individual institutions and systems having their own standards that they're reviewing. We haven't seen finalized versions of those. We have no idea if they're adopting the guidelines, what they're doing with the guidelines. I think those are still a lot of unanswered questions for community in particular and for us, which we can follow up on. Um, and in addition, I think a point that Councilor Mejia made with respect to how we as a body, as counselors who represent folks on the ground can be a part of some of your 
advocacy in, in conversations, not just in the midst of COVID-19, but on other issues that come up in the medical space. Um, I think we, we, we probably should be thinking about what could that look like in terms of consistent advocacy around these issues, healthcare related, um, and, and particularly with through the equity lens. Um, I also want to uh, just, um, I think, flag, oh no, I just want to speak to the, on the record. I too, I was, frankly, Council Roy and I were texting at different moments um, during this hearing, was very disappointed or extremely disappointed that no one from the administration came, uh, whether it's from our health commission, um, from the mayor's office. I mean, we talked about this issue quite a bit, um, raised it up on one of our calls, you know, mayor, administration, what is your stance and response to these guidelines? What's our position as a city, right? The council is one piece of our city government, obviously. Um, so I was extremely disappointed and I understand how busy our people are. Um, and we have a lot of hearings, but in the case where the council hearings are related to COVID-19 in particular and a pressing issue, um, I do think it's important that uh, folks show up. If you're able to spend as much time as you did with us today, um, I think it's important that the administration do so too. And so we will we will bring that that concern back. And I know other councils express that too, um, because I think it's critically important on the council side, working with the administration, working with the mayor, um, collectively around these issues is, is critical to moving the conversation forward um, and to frankly bringing more light um, and attention. Um, and then lastly, um, I am here too as a partner in this work. Um, my team also was participating on the call and taking notes. Um, so if other things come up for you as individual uh, providers around some of the housing issues, um, unemployment issues, other case uh, issues, we're also a resource for, for your constituents with respect to that or your patients. Um, so use us. Um, we have folks who are out of jobs. We've been helpful in getting them unemployment benefits, other financial resources, small business owners who need help, all the other things that are informing their health right now, we can be helpful too. So use us as a resource with respect to that. Do spread our information around. Um, most of it is on the website. We are responsive. Well, I can't speak for everyone. My team and I are responsive and we try to be um, responsive within 24 to 48 hours understanding the immediate needs. So do use us for that. And thank you so much. And I do think it's powerful that I think all the ladies are left um, behind. And so kudos to, to us women. Thank you, Council Royal. <laughs> and stay safe, you guys. Thank you. I don't disagree. Uh, Councilor Braden, I see your camera on and, and you missed the question session. So if you do have a question, feel free to use this time to ask it. Oh, hold on one second. Let me unmute you. There you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all the, the panel. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a healthcare professional myself. I'm a physical therapist by profession. I, I, I know the agonizing, uh, exp I have had the agonizing experience of standing at a hospital bed with someone who's in a, a medical crisis and I'm trying to do, uh, in, in, in UK we do, we don't, we don't have respiratory therapists. So the physical therapists do a lot of the respiratory care. So in those desperate moments when you know someone needs a ventilator and you're in a small community hospital that doesn't have access to a ventilator and you know the person's going to die, uh, it's very uh, intense and it's, it's uh, incredibly difficult uh, work conditions that you, you folks are working under every day. And I really appreciate the, the, uh, your passion and your dedication to seeking uh, justice and equity in our healthcare system uh, here in this moment of crisis, but we need to address this uh, going forward. Uh, it's not going to go away when this crisis is over. So please uh, use our colleagues and our, myself as an, a resource to help advocate for to improve this situation. And uh, thank you so much for all you're doing. And please be safe and stay well. Thank you so much. President Janier or President ba uh, President Bob. President Janey or Councillor Bach, if you have any closing comments and your camera goes on, I'll, I'll know. Councillor Councillor Bach, you're good. Okay. Uh, and so uh, with that, uh, I'm going to essentially close it out for the panel and allow public comment. We do have somebody waiting in the waiting room to give public comment. They've been very patient. Um, I just want to reiterate in my closing how grateful I am to all of you being here. Uh, please do stay safe. Uh, please do reach out to us for any kind of 
auxiliary issues or adjacent issues. If you have patients who have needs, please do reach out to our office. Please consider us resources for that. Um, if there's uh, advocacy issues that we can uplift, please bring that to our attention. Uh, our work does not stop here on these guidelines. These guidelines are a matter of life and death for many. Uh, if we reach that stage, uh, they're a matter of life and death for many in my district and the districts of others. Uh, I, I know uh, Councillor Campbell has a high proportion uh, or disproportionate rate as far as population to infection. And so this is a very major issue for us. It's a significant issue. I echo my colleagues in hoping that in the future on issues like this, uh, you know, just not just even as a city councilor, just as a resident of Boston, it would, for me, I believe it's appropriate that when we're discussing racial inequity, especially in life-saving guidelines that the administration have a presence at that hearing. Uh, but also uh, as important to me is that at the hospitals that many of you work at, uh, their administration also uh, be present. Uh, all of them were requested. Uh, and so uh, as we move forward, I think Councillor Campbell has outlined uh, and you have outlined a lot of the work that we can do moving forward, specifically on uh, ensuring that those guidelines become public, that we know uh, because in the document that was sent to me by the uh, conference of uh, let me just make sure I say this correctly. Conference of Boston Teaching Hospitals, on behalf of their members, it doesn't include whether or not they uh, are in putting in place these guidelines, whether they put in place their own guidelines, what their issues with this guideline is. Actually, uh, just to quote it very briefly, it says the Commonwealth Crisis Standards of Care guidelines were updated on April 20th and posted to the Commonwealth COVID-19 website. Our testimony will reflect our strong support for the critical updates to the guidelines and our continued welcoming to broad public input on the guidelines. I would consider this pretty passionate, pretty heartfelt, pretty insightful uh, input, and I hope to see this put into future guidelines or the guidelines that these hospitals create themselves and then lift up as models. And so moving forward from here, we'll do quite a bit of outreach uh, in partnership with both folks on the ground and on the front lines like you and with the hospitals at which you work uh, to ensure that we're making sure that if the worst comes to pass, that we don't do a three or four month autopsy to say all the ways in which we could have been better. Um, and so uh, thank you again to all of you. Uh, I also will note Councillor Campbell's point that it was our uh, women doctors who were here uh, to lift up these issues at the end. And so thank you so much for being here. Um, on a personal note, I can't wait to have my nieces watch this. This is fantastic. And so thank you so much for being here. Um, and uh, I'm gonna change it over to, uh, I see two people who are here for public comment. Uh, for those on the panel, you're welcome to stay for the public comment. Um, or, you're, or you're welcome to leave. We've taken up quite a bit of your time and I really appreciate you giving it to us so generously. Um, and thank you, thank you again. Uh, and frankly, um, I, I, I couldn't have thought of a better way to present these issues or to bring them to light. So thank you so much for everything you've done. Uh, and we'll make sure to keep you in touch in ways in which we can continue to work on this move forward. So thank you so much. Um, with that, I'm gonna switch it over to public comment. Uh, Lorena Estrada Martinez is here. Uh, and so I'm going to, you're unmuted. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Can you hear yeah. me? Yes. And so I'm going to give you uh, three minutes to kind of introduce yourself and to give public comment uh, and, and go in that manner. So uh, you have, I, I know, I don't know if you can see everybody's here, but some of the panelists are still here. Counselors are still here. I'm still thank here. You. So. Yeah. You know, I thank you so much for everything that, that you guys are doing. I just, I just heard you all for the last two and a half hours and I'm, in awe of the stamina that you all have at the moment. Um, and really, I'm, my name is Lorena Estrada Martinez. I'm a professor of public health at UMass Boston School for the Environment. I'm also part of the Gaston Institute at UMass. Um, and Lorena Rivera is part of one of the task force. And we were talking a lot about, uh, about this in the Gaston and how it impacts disproportionately Latinos and the Latinx community, not just in Boston, but more broadly. And we were uh, trying to figure out how to best uh, gather data more regionally and how w could we help facilitate that process and sort of think about, I'm a, I'm a, I, my training is in epidemiology, so I'm trying to sort of figure out how to best uh, gather information that would help um, get the, the necessary resources, not just really in Boston, but some of the, the smaller cities, uh, you know, Revere, Chelsea, Lynn, Lawrence, all of these other places that are not necessarily so close to the resources that we have in the city. 
I don't know if anybody wanted to comment on that. Uh, and so um, if anybody has any comment on that, uh, please, you can just unmute yourself and, and go. If not, it's, it's fine. If anybody would like to comment on that. And just to be clear, what was the question again, just so you can... It's not, it's not really a specific question, but more about how we can, at the Gaston Institute, where we uh, like to do a lot of data and facilitate a lot of community meetings, uh, how much, uh, how we can help facilitate getting some of the information and communicating with uh, some of the smaller cities and towns that have a lot large Latino population. Um, basically, we're trying to understand how to best get you the city, the government, right? Cities with the city council, yep. Revere, Telsey, all of these get people together to uh, work on getting the necessary resources and tapping into the different medical communities in the area. And, and so it sounds like what you're trying to figure out is the best way as a data gathering institute to get data from hospitals to then what provide kind of data. Yeah, exactly. Would you like us to, to put forward? Okay, and so maybe uh, maybe some of the doctors can just uh, give some semblance of how how data gathering could be done uh, at the grassroots level yes. at their hospitals. I can tell you that the data that I'm seeking, uh, just very specifically, is data on who's not getting tested. We currently don't have data on who's being told that they don't have a test uh, or that they can't be tested and essentially being told to self-quarantine and just assume they have it. We don't have that data. Um, I don't have data for instance, uh, complete data on racial demographics yet. I don't have complete data on income, socioeconomic brackets. I don't have complete data on whether or not somebody is, for instance, using public transportation or using personal transportation, uh, or whether or not somebody is what their occupations are. There's a, there's a lot of incomplete data there that really, from a government perspective, it makes it difficult to be prescriptive with policy. Um, and so in terms of how we do that. Uh, also, I don't have data on whether or not a patient is monolingual or bilingual, so there's a lot of assumptions that happen in that void. For instance, if uh, the Latino population is a specific uh, component of the racial data, does that mean that their component there is based on the fact that they don't speak English, or is it similar? So without knowing if they're monolingual or bilingual, I can't actually speak to that, right? And so I'm Latino. If I was positive, the issue would not be that I don't speak English. And so there's a lot of assumptions that get made in that void that make it so that we can't be as prescriptive as possible from a policy standpoint and where we give our assistance for resources. I'm sure it's equally frustrating for our doctors. Um, and so I guess the question would be, if there's data that you believe should be getting collected that could be collected, what is it, uh, I guess, is what Lorena is asking. Um, and also, what, what ways can data collection agencies kind of partner with hospitals to do this? So if anybody wants to answer that, if not, it's fine. Um, it's something for us to ponder and, and reach back out to uh, you, Lorena, on if, if that's the case. Okay. Yep. So I, I will just uh, maybe um, suggest that one of the uh, data points that you might want to collect information on is uh, household um, and number of members living in any given household. Um, and how that, um, in terms of the square footage, how does that implicate um, their, you know, health risk for um, transmission and their um, inability to socially distance from family members? That would be interesting to know, like the density of the households in any given zip code. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's actually something. Uh... That's a great observation. It would be incredibly helpful as well. Um, anybody else have anything that maybe uh, should be getting tracked but isn't getting tracked necessarily? OK. And so as things come across, uh, I'll send that to, to you, uh, Lorena, in, in terms of the Gaston Institute. And also, uh, there are things that I'm uplifting myself every day on that front. And I believe that concludes uh, all of our public comment. Uh, at this moment. And so thank you again, everybody. This would adjourn uh, our, our council hearing. Uh, thank you so much for giving nearly three hours of your time uh, to really digging in. Um, I'm actually, we have staff watching this. I'm probably gonna rewatch this just because the amount of data and information that you've given is really good uh, and really prescriptive and things that I can now lift up and, and really 
work with my partners in government to make sure that we address them in real ways um, and looking forward, figuring out ways in which we can use the minds and, and the brilliance in front of us and, and folks in the field to really start getting ahead of these issues before we, we have our next pandemic, right? So thank you so much for all of that you've done uh, with that. This, this hearing is adjourned. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.